How we doing, guys? I'm gonna get the music on. Hold on. There we go. How we doing, everybody? Happy Sunday. Welcome. Welcome to the stream. This is our first discussion stream on the channel, I guess you could say, where we uh, we take some time and we talk about One Piece. We take a look back at the story, not necessarily talking about the new chapters, not talking about the current events. We're gonna just take a, a you know look at One Piece from a bird's eye view and try and you know, uh, settle some discussions or talk about some issues or not necessarily issues, but things in the story that I, I want to talk about. Um, how's it going, everybody? What's up, Q? What's up, Marth? Thank you. I saw you rated the stream. Thank you so much. Reverse. What's going on, brother? Yeah, almost at 60K. We're very, very close. We're like less than 100 subs away from 60. Um, hope everyone's doing well on this fine... Sunday evening. It was 4:20 yesterday. <laughs> a little bit, uh, a little bit exhausted yesterday after the Knicks game. That was a real hype one. Very close, too close for comfort. I got to be honest. I need Brunson to, to pick it up for the rest of this playoff series. Um, but let's let's save the basketball for another time. So today, guys, we are going to be talking about the best and the worst arcs in One Piece. Now I know this topic might get people a little bit, you know, uh, I don't know how to put it, you know, a little uh, passionate, a little inflamed, depending on, you know, what I think is a good arc, what I think is not a good arc, or I don't know if there's any outright bad arcs in One Piece, but by One Piece standards, like the, you know, the standards that the peaks of the, the series have set for us, I think there are arcs that definitely uh, under deliver. Yeah, defensive is a good word, I guess you could say. Uh, but, you know, what I will say at the end of the day, if you like any arc in One Piece, I think you're not wrong for that. One Piece delivers in every arc at least a little bit. And I've reread the story a bunch of times now. I find new reasons to like every arc whenever I reread the story. There are arcs that I don't really like, but I'll find reasons to like them when I when I go back and visit them. I've had I've done complete 180s on arcs on reread. You know, arcs that I thought were just bad and not very good at all and then i reread them and i recontextualized some of the things with knowledge that we get from later in the story especially as recent developments have been made in the plot and i'll find that I i've done 180s on certain arcs for example one that comes to mind is fishman island i actually like fishman island a lot and uh you know with the exception of some issues i take you know with with how some of the characters are written um some of the side characters aren't very compelling Overall, I think Fishman Island is great, and it, it encapsulates a lot of the themes of the story. It has insane world building. It brings back characters that we didn't see in forever, like being able to see a young Arlong uh, in action again in Fisher Tiger's flashback is awesome. Uh, we get a lot of like looks at characters through through the flashbacks in this in that arc. You know, you have uh, young Arlong. You get a look at younger Jimbei. You have you get to see. Uh, I, I think you get a little bit of Hachi in there. You get to see young Koala. You get to see uh, young Kizaru. You know, even that flashback alone <coughs> had a lot to offer. Um, and I'm not going to harp on Fishman. I do want to get to the main topic. But just to add to that, Fishman Island, as overhated as it is, in my opinion, that, that arc gave us two flashbacks. It wasn't even one. We had two flashbacks that arc, and both of them were bangers. They were both really, really good. And they're the best part of the arc, in my opinion. Like, if you go reread Fishman Island, I guarantee the part that you're going to be the most engrossed in is the two flashbacks that happen with Fisher Tiger and Otohime. How they contrast, the two flashbacks contrast with each other very heavily. The way that Fisher Tiger rejects humans by the end of his life, and Otohime accepts humans and doesn't want the hatred to be carried on, even though. You know, she was at, on her, uh, on death's do door. Uh, the irony of Fisher Tiger being killed by, um, you know, humans and then dying because of his own pride. And then Otohime dying because of her own kind. Because of that same hatred that Fisher Tiger bore towards humans. That same hatred that got carried on in um, Hody Jones was the same thing that got Otohime killed, one of their own kind. So it's like, it's a whole message on the cycle of hatred. It's a really beautiful arc. I think that there's a lot to love in Fishman Island. Um, so that's an example of an arc that like on reread, you know, I came to appreciate it a lot more. So I think today, today's discussion is going to be mainly 
uh, to figure out, you know, where all the arcs in One Piece fall on this this scale, you know, what they do right, what they do wrong. We're going to keep the stream relatively short, I hope, you know, somewhere in the in the one to two hour range. But we're going to try and cover everything, you know, pretty, um, pretty quickly. So I see uh, a couple things real quick. Like the stream if you're here, if you're excited for this talk, if you like my streams in general, if you support my channel, uh, if you want to support my channel, a big way to do that is to give the stream a like. So I'd really appreciate that. Um, and I want to ask you guys a question before we get into it. I want to get chat's opinion on this. I want to know what you guys think. Tell me, what do you guys think? First off, what is the best arc in one piece in your opinion? And it doesn't necessarily have to be the best objectively. What is your favorite? You know, what do you think is, um, what do you think is the arc that moves you the most? What's the arc that you feel the most, you know, tell me that. So I see Dilcor asking, no music going. I, I have music on. Is it too low? You can't hear it. Um, but but tell me uh, tell me in chat, guys. What's your what What do you think is the best arc of One Piece? All right. So let's see. We got a bunch of answers in chat right now. Egghead, Wano, Dressrosa, Water Seven, another Dressrosa. I see Whole Cake, Whole Cake. Egghead. Dexter saying no music. People can hear the music. You guys got low volume. That's that's uh that's on your end, I think. Uh Marine Ford, Alabast. I'm seeing actually a mixed bag. Interesting. Like what do you guys think stands at the peak of One Piece arcs? Like the top, the king of all One Piece arcs. What is the king? Water Seven or Egghead toss up, Alabasta. So I see a lot of like familiar choices. A lot of a lot of them I see a few of the same ones. So there's a bunch of Marine Fords in the chat. There's a bunch of Eggheads in the chat, which I think Egghead is a very valid choice now that we're this far into the arc. Um so we got Ennius Lobby, Water Seven, Marine Ford, Egghead. I saw a few dress rosas in there. Um Let's see what else we got. Yeah, a lot of NES Lobby, especially when I asked like which one's the king of One Piece. I see a lot of Marine Ford and NES Lobby Water Seven. I see so I see Praetorius said movie six. That's very based. I like your decision. If it was canon, I would agree it's up there. <laughs> I love that movie. It's so good. Um, that's the king. In my opinion, that's the king of One Piece movies. If I had to give a title to any One Piece movie, it's movie six. Baron Omatsuri and the Secret Island. And the hidden island, you could say, F fucking incredible. Um, Impel Down is a great choice. That's my. That's in my top three. I kind of consider Impel Down. I I kind of look at the Summit War saga as like a, a complete picture. Uh, I know that's weird because that means I'm also counting like Amazon Lily in that. But like the the progression from Sabo the Archipelago to Impel Down to Marine Ford is, in my opinion, the best sequence in all of One Piece. It's the best part of the story. Um, but if we're talking individually, yeah, I would still put Impel Down up there on its own. Impel Down's amazing. Um, Sway Shocks, thank you for the member message. Uh, member for five months. L let's go. Uh, he said Whole Cake. So Whole Cake's a good choice. I like Whole Cake. Uh, P. Quan BBX, welcome to Commander, my son. Welcome aboard. You are my son. Uh, so yeah, so I see a lot of I see a lot of similar answers. I see a lot of things that I I, I think most people would agree on. Uh, Dilcor, thank you for the member message. Member for ten months, my goat. One year soon, one year soon. It's incredible, right? Where all the members, all the longtime members are getting up there. You guys are getting up there, close to a year for a lot of you guys. I, I someone on my channel actually is close to two years by the looks of it, which is insane. Um. All right, guys, so now that we've done what do you think is the king, let's do the inverse. Tell me, chat, what do you think is the worst arc in One Piece? I want to know what you think is the absolute low point of the story. Name for me which arc didn't do it for you, which one you don't want to reread. And I'm going to just put a little caveat here before the chat goes off. Let's not include Long Ring, Long Land in this discussion, okay? I think Long Ring, Long Ring is a very obvious one. For me, it's like a mini arc. 
uh, I just like for me it like hardly counts if we're, we can't really compare long ring to like the other big arcs so i'm talking like big arcs like real real story beats here which one do you think is the lowest i want to hear i want to hear your guys opinion on that see a couple people say whiskey peak dax said amazon lily is the worst arc that's interesting i think amazon lily is better than the worst i i don't i actually like amazon lily um Especially because of how it connects into Marine Ford and Impel Down and all that stuff, um, and you know Luffy's moment with Boa and fighting the uh, fighting the Snake Twins and covering up the the tattoo on the back, I thought was a really really good moment for Luffy. Especially, it showed a lot of his character. We get Hockey getting introduced more formally. I like Amazon Lily compared to a bunch of the other arcs that are being listed out here by the chat. Um, Dexter, thank you for the member message, bro. Six months. Let's go. Still lacking a bit in that regard. That's fine, bro. You'll catch up eventually. No worries. Atlas 100, thank you, bro, for the member's message. 11 months. He's the closest to a year, it looks like. One year soon, too. Hehe. <laughs> very, very nice. I appreciate you guys. Thank you. Uh, so let's see what the chat's saying. Worst arc. I see Thriller Bark a few times. I see Whiskey Peak on here. I see Punk Hazard. I see um, Orange Town. Uh, Fishman, Fishman got a few choices. Uh, I did establish earlier why I disagree on Fishman personally. Wano, I see Wano getting put up here a few, t actually a considerable amount of times. There's a few people putting Wano up. Um, of course, someone mentioned Long Ring, Long Land. Uh, people, Q says the Balden, his favorite arc is the Balden Island arc. I can't wait, I can't wait for Oda to get, get us there. Um, Punk Hazard, yep. See a, a Skypea mixed in there. East Blue. East Blue, I think, is a interesting one. I, I like East Blue a lot because of how much it does for the story. The setup is necessary. You wouldn't be able to have the rest of the adventure without the setup that happens in East Blue. So we have to give it credit. Syrup Village, individually, if we're going to single out something in East Blue, Syrup Village is definitely towards the bottom. I think it's one of the worst parts of One Piece. Uh, let me just clarify. When I say worst... You know, I know it's a very strong word, but uh, we're talking relative, right? I'm not saying Syrup Village is the worst arc in all of Shonen. I'm saying that it's the worst arc in one or one of the worst arcs in One Piece, which I mean, One Piece sets a very high bar for its arcs, right? Like we're, we're talking the same manga that had Dressrosa, the same manga that had Marine Ford and Ennius Lobby and Egghead. When you're stacking up Syrup Village next to it, you know, it's going to be a very, very difficult thing to to match up to, especially because it's so early in the story. Oda did not have his world fleshed out yet. Uh, and the best fights we get in that arc, the only fights we get in that arc are Django, the Nyaban brothers, and Kuro. All of which, you could argue, uh, those fights suck. So, you know, not that... Uh, you know, especially compared to the good fights in One Piece. So... Syrup over Orange Town. Yeah, so I see a lot of familiar familiar things. Tessa says, I think this whole discussion is kind of silly because I love the series in general. I think we should do better than just blindly supporting everything in the series and saying it's all perfect. I think it's important to have these discussions and establish what some arcs did right, what some arcs did wrong, because these are going to be discussions regardless of what anyone thinks. People are going to talk about this. Anytime you read an arc, whether or not, I mean, you love it, you might love it, but if you read an arc, I'm, I'm gonna probably bet money, at some point in the arc, you're thinking to yourself, hey, this arc is better or worse than that arc. Yeah, I like this arc, but I don't like it as much as this arc or that arc. So subconsciously, you're going to be you're going to be comparing it to other things in the story. I think that's just a natural reaction to reading it. Um, <clears throat> so if you're going to subconsciously compare arcs, and if you're going to like you know try and measure them up in your head to each other, I think it's important that we talk about it out loud because a lot of people will say this arc is trash, this arc is amazing, this arc is too boring, this arc is so crazy. There's insane developments every chapter. You know, I think that we, we should get this uh, out in the open and try and figure out as a community, you know, at least in the Hidden Island community, where we stand, what makes a good arc, what makes a bad, well, what makes a good One Piece arc, what makes a bad One Piece arc. I think we can kind of line all this up and, and go over it. 
Um, so we got a bunch of answers. I see, you know, uh, a lot of familiar answers. Now, I know my thumbnail has uh, Ennius Lobby and Water 7 on one side for the best. And then for the worst, I put Punk Hazard. I don't necessarily think that those are the best and the worst. I just had to pick an example of a good arc and a bad arc for the thumbnail. And for me, those two stand out as um, opposites uh, in a lot of ways. You know, which arc is good? Uh, which arc is bad? I think that th those two are good examples of each. Um, let's see. What, what did Dak say here? What's up, Dak? Wano is like the 73-9 Warriors losing losing after up 3-1 in the finals. Making it to Game 7 in the finals is a, is a success for most teams, but not to them. Wano was good, but should have been better. I agree. I think that's a very great point. Wano being a very, very impactful, significant arc was expected for Wano. And it delivered. It was a very significant, big... It was a large arc. It was it, At the very least, you have to give it the magnitude. It was huge. It was a very, very big arc. It had a lot of insane, crazy developments that happened. But that I think that was the minimum expectation for Wano. And I think in other areas, it fell short. And wh what I'm going to do is actually, I want to outline... Um, I wrote some notes here. Basically, really short chart. But I want to outline what I think makes a good One Piece arc. So let's... Let's pull up our Word doc document. Let's make this text a little bit smaller. You guys can read that, right? That's not like... That should be fine. Okay. Ignore. Can I just... Don't check for this issue. Thank you. Alright. So... What makes a good One Piece arc? Well, I think it's a number of factors. And I what I'm, what I'm hoping to do is lay out all of this. And then we're going to take arcs that we think are good or bad. And we're going to try and line them up next to these details and see how well they fit. So for a good arc, I think it encompasses a bunch of things. A good One Piece arc. I think first and foremost, we need an interesting location. I think a location that brings a lot to the table, whether or not it's the unique quality of it. So like a location that's very interesting visually, that's something that is, is unique that you don't normally see every day in manga and anime. Um, so for an example, I think Water 7 and Ennius Lobby are very, very interesting locations. An island that's a giant water fountain. It's absolutely fucking beautiful. With highways and streets being made from the, the flow of the water. With surrounded by... Um, surrounded by a shore which is like docks filled with shipwrights building ships. Uh, the, the fact that Water 7 is sinking constantly beneath the waves and they have to build upward to stay above the sea line. They get hit by the Aqua Laguna every year. Like, so... <clears throat> Just to harp on wa uh, Water 7 for a minute. <clears throat> <coughs> Excuse me. Jeez, let me get some water. So I think Water 7 comes together as a very cohesive, well-thought-out location. It is very uh, beautiful. It's very visually interesting. It has a lot of moving parts. Um, you have... This, like I said earlier, you have all these different locations that are they're called waters. So Water 7 is one of them. Uh, and the different water islands, these waters, are, are basically shipbuilding islands, if I'm remembering correctly. And Water 7 is the most famous shipbuilding island. So they have, it's a, it's a big fountain city. They rely on water, but at the same time, water is their biggest enemy. Because the water that helps with their shipwright business, the water that helps with how they get around the city, the water that, that makes their city so beautiful. It's even in the food. You have the water steak or whatever, you know, all this stuff that they benefit from as at the same time as their own worst enemy because the Aqua Laguna strikes all the time uh, and their city is constantly sinking. And because of this, they have to continuously build upward. Uh, so it's a double-edged sword. Their location, uh, the nature of their city is a double-edged sword for the people of Water 7. And... It's this, it's this problem that leads to a lot of innovation and a lot of inventions and things like the the sea train and, uh, you know, everything that Frankie has built and then Iceberg, you know, desiring to make the island float or something like that in order to prevent it from sinking. 
all these things play into the nature of the island being a shipbuilder's island. It's a shipwright's island. So it's an island full of inventors and their constant dilemmas provide uh, a context for their innovation. Uh, and so on and so forth. And you have this transition into NES Lobby, which is a location that's literally suspended over a massive hole in the water. And you get there by the, the sea train that was invented at Water 7, and it connects directly to this Hall of Justice. And this Hall of Justice is where Tom was like, Tom's trial was uh, brought to when he was, you know, made to be executed. And Robin gets kidnapped here and then gets brought to there by the sea train that Tom built. And it's like, it's all very cohesive and it's all very unique. And I think that's what makes Water 7 and NES Lobby so compelling as a, uh, as a, as a place in the One Piece world, because it's not... It's not simply, you know, a lot of islands tend to be isolated and their problems are isolated there. But Water 7's problems come from external sources. Water 7's conflict moves to an external place. It's not all trapped on this one island. The problems aren't trapped there. CP0 came from outside and, you know, created problems there and then left and brought their problems to NES Lobby. Like, it, it, it almost feels like... Um, in the same way that CP0 arrived at Water 7 and created problems there, Luffy was just arriving and, you know, what was meant to be a small pit stop ended up being a long adventure on this island. Just like how CP9 kind of like dedicated years of their life to this mission uh, that ultimately failed just to find Pluton, which spanned them, couldn't do when he made that pit stop on the island a long time ago. So I like Water 7 a lot. Um, so it do definitely feels like an interesting, cohesive, well thought out location. Uh, all the shipwrights being around the edge of the island while towards the center is where all the commerce is makes a lot of sense all that flows from the top down so like all the trades that happen higher up on the island all the the market you know all that stuff works its way out to the edge by the the flowing water that flows downward it flows down towards the shore where all the trading happens where all the ships get built where the train departs from the to and from the island so like the location makes sense it, it totally makes sense um, here's an example, uh, another example of an interesting location. I'm not going to go as in depth into this one, but I think Whole Cake Island is really interesting. Why? Because it's not simply one island. It's a series of islands. It's a massive archipelago and you're constantly jumping from one island to the other. Each island has its own respective theme and the theme, let's not forget, is very unique on its own. It's food. You have islands made of food and there's not, I mean, what other anime or manga are you going to read where you find food islands, where you find, you know, islands made entirely of food items and, and like, it's very unique for One Piece's standards. Here's an example of a location I don't think is very interesting. Wano. I don't think Wano is very interesting. I'm going to be perfectly honest with you guys. I think Wano is not the most interesting location. So like what we were talking about earlier, where... Wano was great in a lot of regards, it lived up to a lot of the hype in many ways, but in other ways it didn't, and I think that was the Achilles heel of the Wano arc. Uh, I think Wano itself is not the most interesting location, because what is Wano ultimately? It's feudal Japan, and there's not really much else to it. There's nothing that uh, unique or bizarre or, or that that is you know, um, spectacular on Wano itself. I guess Onigashima, you could say, is the real, real, like, unique location in the Wano arc, but you gotta remember that we spent 80 or so chapters on mainland Wano, and mainland Wano didn't really have much to offer. It was just samurais, uh, in traditional Japanese homes and castles, uh, and the landscape was, although I will say the depiction of the landscape was pretty interesting, the way it was like made to look like, you know, old style Japanese paintings. But I think overall, like as a location, it doesn't really bring as much new to the table for, for manga in general that let's say Water 7 or Whole Cake did. I think it was a lot more of a flat kind of boring location for me, which is why people didn't care too much, I think, about... Um, the aesthetics of what, like, I don't know. I, I feel like people don't talk about it very much. People don't like, if you ask someone, okay, let me ask you this question. If you could live on one island in the One Piece world, where would you choose to live? Maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like most people wouldn't say Wano because I feel like you could get Wano in the real world. <laughs> you could go to Japan and see all those same temples and all the same culture in real Japan, you don't really get that anything unique. You know, a lot of people will say Water 7. See, I see people saying Water 7 would be where they'd want to live. 
I agree. Why would you want to live in Water 7? Because it's a really interesting location. It, it's so beautiful. It seems really nice. You could look... I, I guarantee a lot of the people saying Water 7, you probably don't give a shit about the Aqua Laguna. You would live there anyway, even if the Aqua Laguna is a huge inconvenience. But uh, most people probably wouldn't want to live on Wano. And let's assume that Wano didn't have the polluted air, the polluted Wano, the slave, or the polluted water, the slavery. Let's assume Wano was perfectly fine now. I, I still probably wouldn't want to live there because it's not really that unique or interesting. There's so many better locations in one piece to choose from. Uh, so this is an example of what I mean, uh, you know. Uh, I see Mango Man said Amazon Lily. <laughs> I don't know how well that would work out for you, my friend. I, I think that might be a little bit of a tough... Uh, sell for most people, uh, especially half the population probably wouldn't be able to have a, uh, uh, ordinary or, or comfortable or safe or long life on Amazon Lily. Uh, but you know, you know what I mean? Like, I think Wano in that respect is a little bit boring. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you wouldn't want to live on Onigashima either. Onigashima, you know, it's a giant skull island. And, and le let's be real, the interior of Onigashima is just more Japanese architecture. So... Uh, the other elements of Wano are very fantastical and, and interesting and cool and, and grand, but the actual location itself, I think, is a little bit stale. A little bit stale. Especially when Naruto is a big, was, a, was One Piece's biggest rival uh, for a long time. We had One Piece and Naruto kind of rivaling each other. And a lot of the setting of Naruto is, shares a lot in common with the setting of Wano. In terms of like old style feudal Japan era, um, obviously it's not. They don't, you know, it's it, the Naruto takes it three degrees further. But I'm just saying, you know, we've seen this before. Is what I'm trying to say. We've seen Wano before in other series. We've seen Wano before elsewhere. We've seen Wano. We see Wano in the real world. Uh, so that's number one. Interesting location. If your arc has an interesting location, here's another point I want to add. If the location is relevant, I think that's a big important detail. Uh, the location has to be relevant. So actually, Wano is relevant. It's very important to the, the world at large of One Piece. But here's an example of a, a location that isn't relevant. Uh, Thriller Bark. I think one reason, despite Thriller Bark ve being very unique of a location to visit, despite Thriller Bark being very cool, it's like a Tim Burton horror Halloween land with this haunted castle and you got zombies and you have the curly trees and you have the dark night and the fog and the moon and the, uh, you know, there's shadows everywhere and, and you know, there's all these weird mutant amalgamation creatures. It's, it has like very mysterious kind of vibe on the surface i think what people don't like about thriller bark as a locale is the relevance because thriller bark itself does not really have any relevance to the outside world of one piece it doesn't have any um connection to anything in one piece as far as we know right now it's just gecko moria's ship which happens to be an island so let me ask you like imagine imagine if an entire arc was set on an enemy's pirate ship. I feel like that would kind of be, um, it, it's not enough. It's not enough because in every other arc of one piece or for most of the other arcs, each location has some significant connection to the history of the world or the ongoing dynamics of the world. You have water seven being an important hub of shipbuilding and being the place where Roger's ship was built. It's, it's a location that, you know, has direct ties to the world government. It's directly linked to Ennius Lobby. Uh, and Ennius Lobby, you know, which it takes us there, has huge, huge... It's the first place we really understand what the world government is. Prior to Ennius Lobby, we don't understand how serious of a problem the world government is to the world at large. Uh, until we get there, then we see, you know, Spandam points to the flag and, and establishes that the world government is this big alliance of nations. And if you stand against them, you're going to be destroyed. Um, that sort of thing, you know. Lo uh, Skypea, even though Skypea is so disconnected from the rest of the One Piece world, uh, I think that there's a plus and a minus with Skypea. Yeah, we know now it has the relevance with the Poneglyphs and the Shandorans and the, the symbolism of it all does connect to the broader world. But one problem with Skypea is that its location is completely disconnected from the rest of the world. So uh, not only should it be an interesting location, but I think it's an extra plus if it's a relevant location. 
you know, having a location uh, that is going to teach you something new about the One Piece world and connect to the other places we've been to in some significant way, I think is very important in making the story feel like it has a flow and that everything is, is connected. It feels like a very lived in real world because in the real world, locations do relate to each other. Your country is going to borrow a lot from its neighboring country. Um, <clears throat> You know, the, those sorts of things. The politics of one country are going to influence the politics of another. Trade between one country is going to influence trade with another. Ongoing wars are going to impact their neighbors. That's how a world feels real. So when a location in One Piece does that, it manages to accomplish that, that relevancy, that impact on other locations, uh, that connection. I think that's what makes an, a location truly work. Um... So interesting and relevant. So that's the first point. I'm going to try and get through the rest of these a little bit quicker, but I just want to provide examples so it's clear what I'm talking about. Next, compelling villain. An arc for a One Piece arc to be good, this much should be obvious. The villain needs to be compelling. You need to have a villain that is not just a joke, right? Because if I'm laughing at the villain start to finish, I'm not going to take the villain seriously. I'm not going to take his ambition seriously. I'm not going to take the threat seriously. Anything that he does, I'm just going to kind of, it's going to go over my head because I, I'm not invested in the villain. So you need a compelling villain to make an arc work. You need a villain that creates a conflict that does something that makes Luffy mad and makes the viewer also feel something. You need the reader to feel to feel an emotion you it, the ideal is that the villain makes the reader upset if the villain is making you upset as a reader and and not in a way where like i hate the 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 way the villain is written i mean upset like how could he do this to my favorite characters how could he do such a horrible thing to all these nice people if the villain's getting you to feel that then the villains accomplish their job because then when they get defeated by the hero it feels like a very earned victory. It feels like the victory is accomplishing something. I think that's the biggest point. If the villain is compelling, then it means defeating the villain is by extension compelling. Defeating the villain actually feels like you've accomplished something in the world because you've gotten rid of such an evil, despisable force. Get completely, you know, remove them from, remove the problem from the system. So examples of good villains, Doflamingo, Doflamingo is a good villain, Kaido, Kaido is a good villain, I, I'll, I'll say this, Kaido is a good villain, I think he has his problems, uh, and those problems are, are hard to ignore sometimes, but Kaido overall is a good villain, defeating Kaido felt like a big accomplishment, Kaido really really felt like he was fucking over Wano big time, big time, and that's something we can't just pretend didn't happen, um, I would say Anel. Yeah, Enel feels like a good villain. I would say Enel is a good villain. A little bit shallow, but a good villain. He's compelling. Uh, he he felt dangerous. The majority of the arc, he felt like a constant, constant threat. You know? Um, Enel felt like a serious problem, and it was it was a it would have been a travesty to let Skypea, you know, leave Skypea there stuck with him and having to deal with, with fucking Enel. Because he was ruling over them with an iron fist. They weren't even able to think the wrong thing without getting vaporized. So he was a massive, massive threat. A constant problem. Um, I see a $2 super chat from Kibari2600. Thank you so much. Uh, they said, it has to be as consistently as engaging, consistently engaging as possible. So if you're referring to the locations, yeah, I agree. The location has to engage the reader constantly. They have to have something... Um, to, to bring to the table that the reader was maybe not expecting or to keep them involved in what's happening. Uh, and, and this goes for the villain too. The villain has to be engaging. When the villain's on screen, they have to feel like a threat. You have to be worried. When the villain's on panel, you have to be worried for the good guys that are in the same place as him. If Doflamingo's in the room with our protagonists, that has to be tense. A good villain will accomplish that. So... Bad villains, Caesar Clown, terrible villain, terrible, not good at all, Foxy, hardly counts as a villain, but, you know, just being real, Foxy's not a very good villain, um, I would, Big Mom, uh, if, if it weren't for Katakuri at the end of Whole Cake, I think people would have said that Big Mom 
sucked. If, if if people would like whole cake a lot less if it was just Big Mom that arc. I feel like Katakuri saved the villains of Whole Cake Island because Big Mom alone, yes, Big Mom was a huge threat. Yes, Big Mom was very very dangerous. She was evil. But there's a couple other factors that go into this. Obviously, I'm I I I was compelled by by Zef being taken hostage and by the whole like forced wedding situation yes i think that was compelling i think in that that's a big plus on big mom's part but i think overall there's too many situations where especially now because you know i'm not just singling out whole cake island we got to talk about uh the other arcs that big mom has been in and i feel like big mom in wano felt incredibly underwhelming she was the butt of too many jokes the amnesia thing frankie riding a motorcycle on her face uh getting tag teamed by kid and law and you know talking all this shit and then getting absolutely destroyed um you know very shortly after i, I think that big mom became a little bit too much of a plot device a little bit too much of a uh, a butt of the joke especially later in the story that you know uh it, it, it impacts Big Mom's whole stature as a villain. But let's say, isolate the whole cake arc. Big Mom had good points. Big Mom had bad points. Uh, I think Katakuri did a lot of the carrying by the end there, personally. The wedding cake thing, I think that was... That was the biggest mark against Big Mom, was the wedding cake chase for 20 chapters. Totally unnecessary. Um, Big Mom turning into a crying baby because of the Mother Caramel thing. Like, I like the flashback. I like the whole story about it. I just think Big Mom is like, I don't know, man. Like, Big Mom just didn't... There, there were times where Big Mom just felt like a nuisance more so than a, a problem or like a big issue. Especially because a lot of the residents of Whole Cake Island didn't seem to be living in misery. If I'm going to be real with you guys. Yeah, Sanji was being held hostage. But the people who lived in Big Mom's kingdom like the average resident, they seemed pretty happy to give up a portion of their soul to continue living there. Like a lot of the people there didn't really, they, they were like happy to go and turn in part of their soul. Like, yeah, I like living here. It's pretty cool here. Like they didn't have a horrible, horrible, like they weren't enslaved like the people of Wano. So there wasn't as much of like a present threat uh, that Luffy had to like save the people of Whole Cake from Big Mom because even after the arc was over, they're still in control. The Big Mom Pirates are still in control of Whole Cake and, and all of Totland. So it's not like that had to be that needed to be fixed. It wasn't fixed. Um, so really for me, like, you know, these are these this is how like a villain can go either way. I don't I don't think Big Mom is solidly in the good or bad camp. I think she's really riding a fine line there personally. But um uh, But yeah, I mean yeah, I get that, Praetorus. You know, Brave New World. This it's like dystopic because uh you know, you, you obviously wouldn't want to give away your soul, but they, they, their, their situation, what I'm saying is it's less pressing than the situation of the people in Alabasta or Skypea or Wano. And that's the real thing it comes down to. It has to be pressing. It has to be a pressing issue because that's, what's going to engage us as a reader, you know, maybe, yeah, it's a dystopia, but all of the one piece world is already a dystopia at the end of the day. So it's not like it's going to be much better anywhere else. Uh, I think what it really needs that, that sense of urgency, that, that, that danger needs to be present for a villain to feel like, okay, we got to take this guy out. Like we got to, we got to end his reign of terror. Um, so compelling villain. And now this next point leads into the, it, it trails off of the compelling villain thing, compelling victims. You need, and, and this goes for side characters. Not only does the villain need to be compelling, the victims of the villain need to be compelling. The side characters of the arc, the people that live on that island, the princess that Luffy has to help, the, the you know, people like Trafalgar Law, like all the side characters of an arc need to be compelling. The people that are directly impacted and harmed by the villain's actions need to be compelling. I need to care about these people because if I don't care about these people, then I don't really care about the villain or whatever the villain does because 
if 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 I'm not, you know, who are you saving from the villain? You have to be saving someone, and to to in, to be engaged in that, you have to want that person to be saved. Now, obviously, I want everyone to live a happy life in One Piece. I want everyone to have a good future in One Piece. I, you know, I want everyone to be saved. Obviously, at the end of the story, but there are some characters that make it hard for me to root for them or to give a shit about their plight because they're just not written very well. Um, so I think compelling victims is very important. Now let's give an example, right? We'll talk about Punk Hazard for a second. Does anyone in the chat remember the names of the Gigantification Experiment children? Do you guys remember the names of any of them? Maybe besides Mocha. I'll give you Mocha. Do you guys remember any of the other names? Anyone? Hit me in chat. I, I know a few people are probably going to Google this. I bet that you're probably going to have to Google it. You can't remember any of their names. Mocha's the only one. Mocha's the only one, probably. Now, the reason for this is because... Uh, <laughs> it's because they're not very compelling. They're not written in a way that makes you interested. They're not written in a way that makes you care about who they are. If you like a character, okay? If you care about a character, you will learn their name. There's no character in One Piece that you care about genuinely that you won't know the name of. You will go out of your way to learn the name of this character. You go on a page and you're like, wow, this guy's fucking awesome. I like this character. Oh, this character's dope. And if you don't know his name, you're going to look it up. You're going to be like, what's this character's name? This dude's dope. I guarantee you, you, no one remembers the names of the people, the, the kids in Punk Hazard that we're supposed to care about. The entire arc, we're babysitting these children and we're supposed to save them and help them. But we can't even remember their names. And they take up panel time. And it, it takes up uh, space in the arc that could be allocated to other more important, interesting characters. But, but, but they're given to these kids. And unfortunately, they have to be given to the kids because they're the only ones that are really victims of Caesar. So this, com this actually goes into the compelling villain thing. Because Caesar is, to a degree, not a compelling villain because his victims are not compelling we don't really care much about his victims as sad as as sad and horrible as it is to say that i don't really care about these kids getting turned into giants and getting experimented on it's because of that that i don't really care about caesar because caesar's doing all this horrible shit and the 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 intention from the author is supposed to be like look at how horrible caesar is look at all the terrible shit he's doing he's such a bad guy and, and th that's what Oda's trying to do, but because I don't really care about these side characters, the the horribleness of everything that Caesar is doing is completely undercut. It's totally weakened because I'm not interested in these side characters. This goes for Wano too. A couple marks off of Kaido, and I, I still think Kaido's a good villain, but a couple things that impacted Kaido's writing were the fact that the people of Wano, we didn't really have a chance to get cr close to the average resident. Uh, Yasuie was like the only example, but most of the people in Wano are just like unnamed townsfolk. We don't really feel their presence on Onigashima because Onigashima is a completely disconnected location from the mainland. So like in Alabasta, there, there was a civil war happening right in the capital, in Alubarna. There was a civil war right there. All the people, the townspeople were right there. The bomb would have detonated right over their heads, right? Wano, we disconnect the entire mainland of Wano from Onigashima. All the fighting happens away from the populace. The populace is on Wano putting their balloons, their, their lanterns up into the sky. So, uh, while I think, I don't think it's the biggest mark against Kaido, I do think it's important that yeah, I, I think the average person of Wano, we don't really get close to. We're more compelled for Momo's sake than we are for the average Wanoite's sake. Uh, we're, we, we care more about what happens to Momo than we care about the Scabbards. The Scabbards is another thing. Like, there's, there's a whole slew of side characters in the Wano arc that uh, I feel like people don't really care that much about. I don't think any of the Scabbards besides maybe Denjiro and Kinemon are in people's top 10 or 20. None of them are, because they're, none of them are really that compelling of characters. I think that's really what it comes down to at the end of the day. We had two of the Scabbards die and one lose an arm. And are really are people, uh, are people still talking about Ashura Doji's sacrifice? Are, we ta are people talking about Izo's sacrifice? Are people really thinking about those characters anymore? I don't think so, because they were just one and done. They came in and they, they got out. We didn't get much development. So compelling victims, I think, is important. 
Um, we Brandon King says we care about Brownbeard and Co. I don't think anyone cares about Brownbeard. To be real, do people care about Brownbeard? Uh, I, I don't care about Brownbeard. I don't care about the Yeti Cool Brothers. I don't give a shit about them. They they're completely irrelevant. Um. You know, we had Thriller Bark. Okay, so Thriller Bark, compelling villain, compelling victims. The villain of the arc was not very compelling. I think Moria, you know, the fact that Moria is a big lazy pirate that doesn't really want to do anything the the hard way. Uh, I think it's it's good narratively. Like, it's like, oh, it shows what happens when a pirate gets demoralized. He got destroyed by Kaido, demoralized, completely gave up on his dreams. He got fat. He let himself go. Uh, and then he's been lazing around on Thriller Bark all this time, you know, just looking for a shortcut to success. I think that's a good character, but in terms of for villain writing, does that make him the most compelling? I don't think so. If we're going to be real here, guys, which which part of Thriller Bark was more gripping to you? Which villain villain of Thriller Bark was more com compelling to you? Was it Moria or was it Kuma? <laughs> when so everyone's favorite part of Thriller Bark is when Kuma arrives and causes trouble for the Straw Hats. I think the, the the part of Thriller Bark that everyone loses it over is 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 Kuma's arrival. So it's weird because Kuma's not a real villain. But at at the time, in that arc when we when we got to that arc for the first time, you didn't know that Kuma was a hero. You didn't know Kuma was a good guy yet. So as far as we the reader knew, reading that arc for the first time, Kuma was a villain. He was a bad guy. He was he was terrifying. Kuma comes into the island. He's making per he made Perona disappear. He goes and talks shit to Moria up in his room. He's like standing head to head with him, and he's like, "Hey, you got to do X, Y, and Z." And then after Moria gets defeated, here's Kuma, wipes out the Straw Hats, puts Zoro on Death's door. He's like, he's giving them tests of will. We genuinely had to deal with the prospect of Zoro or Sanji giving their life for the crew because of this guy. So. The most terrifying villain in the entire arc wasn't even Moria in his own arc, it was Kuma. So I think this really speaks to how compelling of a villain. Like, we didn't have Kuma until the very end. Thanks for thanks for being here, Dak. I see you gotta head out. Like the stream for sure, guys. If you're enjoying this discussion, please like the stream. We're only at 62. Let's try and get that closer to 90 if we can. Um... Yes, yeah, so antagonist, I think, Junior, I agree with you. Antagonist is a better word. At the time, Kuma was an antagonist. So, <clears throat> anta like, a compelling antagonist, I think, is important. Thriller Bark didn't have the most compelling antagonist. Thriller Bark didn't have the most compelling side characters. No one cares about Sindri. No one really cares about that character. No one really cares about Lola. Okay, now I know that Lola's related to Big Mom and there's the whole connection to Whole Cake later. Who cares about Lola, really? I Like, it's it's such a minor thing in the arc and it's not really that well. Like, it's, oh, she becomes Nami's bestie while in the zombie form. Um, oh, Sindri, you know, oh, Dr. Hogback resurrected her because uh, Dr. Hogback was uh, obsessed with this actress that we, we never really hear about again. I, I'm not saying Lola's bad, guys. I'm not, like, I get it. Look, Lola's cool. Like, I f I'm fine with Lola's character. When I'm saying this, I'm not saying she's a bad character. I'm just saying about how much, how much that really affects the plot. How much it really, like, like, do you, when you're reading a chapter and you get to the Lola Nami, like, f besties segment. Like, are you, like, glued to the page? Do you really, are you, like... Whoa, I can't wait to see how this relationship, these characters develop together. Like, I feel like it's so, um, like, tertiary to what's happening in the arc. That, like, yeah, Lola's a good character. She's well-written. She has connections to stuff later in the story. But in terms of, like, how does Lola serve the arc at large? Not really well at all. Doesn't really offer much. Uh, Am Absalom being a creep doesn't really offer much. Moria's crew, the, the people that had got their shadows stolen, they don't really, they don't really stick out in Thriller Bark. No one's really talking about them or thinking about them. What people like from Thriller Bark is Ryuma, because Ryuma, you know, is Ryuma, uh, Kuma, and Brooke, obviously. Brooke joins the crew. Brooke is the only person who got their shadow stolen that was like a victim that we really cared about actually seeing their story play out. And lo and behold, Brooke becomes a protag. He becomes a straw hat. So he, you know, he kind of had some extra points there. <clears throat> so an arc needs compelling villain, compelling victims. Uh, and to, to top off the compelling trio, 
uh, we it needs a compelling conflict. So not only does it need a bad guy that's compelling, it needs good guys that are being affected by the bad guy that are compelling, but there needs to be the, 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 the sum of these two parts, the conflict. What is the conflict of the island? What is the villain doing to the people of this island? Like, it's not so much the villain themselves or the victims themselves. It's what the villains are, what the villain is doing to the victims that needs to be compelling too, right? If the villain, if the villain is simply um, stealing people's underwear in the middle of the night, you know, that's not compelling. Yeah, there's a villain and there's victims, but the, the actual actions that the villain is taking, the conflict that's happening, is not compelling. And it's not only what the villain is doing to the victims, but what the villain is doing to the protagonists. How does How is Luffy, how are the Straw Hats affected by the villain's actions? That's very important. Because if the villain does something that doesn't really matter to the Straw Hats and does something that doesn't really, it's not that big of a deal to the residents or the victims of the island, then we're not going to be invested. Even if the villain and the, the vic victims are really awesome, well-written characters, if there's no conflict that really matters, we're not going to give a shit about what happens to them. They're just going to be there for the sake of it. So... We need those three things. Compelling villain, compelling victims, and compelling conflict, I think is very important. The conflict of Dressrosa was very, very compelling. An island of people, you know, getting turned into toys. Everyone forgets the people that have been turned into toys. They're forced to work underground in slavery. There's this dichotomy between the sunny, bright surface and the deep, dark underground. A king that usurped the actual rightful king and declared himself ruler and betrayed the people of the country. And he's, he's like technically the rightful heir being related to the original royal family. And because of this, he manipulated the populace into hating its previous king. And now that king is being pit against his own people people and being pit in fights to the death in a, in a Colosseum in Colosseum fights and his, and his, um, his granddaughter, there's the same situation, this ousted Royal family. You have, um, not only the internal connections in Dressrosa, it's not just the people that live in Dressrosa that are being tormented by Doflamingo. It's people outside of Dressrosa because you have law who has this deep vendetta against Doflamingo law and Corazon's backstory connecting to how evil this guy is, this villain. Doflamingo is the directly responsible for the events at Punk Hazard. He's working for Kaido, who Luffy and Law agreed to defeat later. Um, Caesar was working for him, and Luffy just defeated Caesar. So the villain not only connects to the, the protags in a very significant way, the, the villain has not only wronged the protags in a significant way, but he's wronged the people of Dressrosa. Uh, and th this creates a very compelling conflict. We, we, we want to see Luffy defeat Doflamingo because he's such an, an insanely unlovable prick. He's such a piece of shit. So, and the things he's doing to everyone are horrible. Doflamingo had that one panel where Law's on the ground in front of Karita Coliseum and Doflamingo's lighting him up with a pistol. Tell me that doesn't compel you. Tell me that doesn't get you you know, excited. Doflamingo having a conflict with Law and Fujitora on green bit, meteor getting summoned down. Three like Mexican standoff, you know, cowboy style in a in a triangle. You know, like there's a lot going on there. Doflamingo being a celestial dragon. Let's not forget this. Celestial dragons are built up to be the most hated villains in the story. We are taught, we were given multiple arcs being taught how terrible the celestial dragons are, how much we should be hating the celestial dragons is is nailed into us by this point in the story and then what lo and behold we find out doflamingo is a celestial dragon so right there there's already an organic conflict just written into his backstory and his character so like i'm saying we have a conflict with the celestial dragons therefore we have a conflict with doflamingo we have a conflict with Kaido, therefore we have a conflict with Doflamingo. We have a conflict with Caesar, therefore we have a conflict with Doflamingo. Uh, the people of Dressrosa are being subjugated. So on and so forth. We can continue down this line. That's what makes a compelling conflict, therefore a compelling villain. Uh, and all these come together to make, you know, a good arc. So let's get to the next point. Uh, this one's a, a really easy one. Good pacing. I don't need to give many examples of this. You guys know what I mean. I've talked about this many times on the channel before. Good pacing is super, super important. You could have all of the above, but if your pacing is shot and nothing happens for 20 chapters and 
it feels like a lot of filler getting thrown in there and things could have been cut and there's a lot of fat that needs to be trimmed off the plot it's not gonna get it's it's not gonna get people uh all the way to the end you know we stuck around in Wano because we knew that the hype was building up to something crazy but let's be real here Wano was paced horribly the pacing was bad so what makes a good one piece arc good pacing okay if you spend 90% of the arc moving at a snail's pace and the last 10% in a mad rush to the finish, it's going to come off weird to the reader. If you have to spend an entire act of Wano doing things like Osoba Mask peeking on people in the women's bath and, uh, you know, Zoro wandering in Ringo and fighting uh, Gyukimaru on the bridge, which never really amounted to shit, by the way. Let's bring that up. Um... You know, if we have all these little things that happen, these side events and things that happen that don't add up to anything by the end of the arc, like, it's forgivable if they're all building up to a purpose. But if you have all these little side events or gags or things like that taking up panel time and space, or, like, villains being established and bad guys being established that don't ever amount to anything. So if you guys want another example, uh, what, I'm blanking on his name. Um, but the, the sumo guy, here's a perfect example of this in Wano. The sumo guy, right? I, I'm blanking on his name. This probably speaks to how shitty of a character he is. You, They spent a good amount of, ch of chapters and pages on Luffy fighting Hold'em and the sumo guy. Now, did that pay off in any way by the end of the arc? Did we ever see him again? Did we ever see Hold'em again? No. They did not matter. It served zero purpose. They were pointless fights. They were one of like 15... Urashima, thank you. Urashima. <clears throat> they were one of like 15 different fights that Luffy gets into in the arc that don't really matter. Uh, and at the end of the day, what's the what was the purpose of it? Like, what did it accomplish for the arc? So, like, you could have all these things that I just listed off, but if the pacing shot and you have to spread out all these good events and the, every time the villain shows up, it has to be interspersed by 20 to 30 chapters of nonsense, it's going to hurt the arc in a big way. And I think that that's really the biggest nail in the coffin for Wano, for me personally, is the pacing. I think the pacing is just bad. Uh, the way that panel time is used in Wano is just bad. The fact that... We got more time dedicated to Luffy sumo wrestling Urashima than we got dedicated to Momo saying goodbye to the Straw Hats at the very end of the arc speaks volumes to me. Momo didn't even get a full panel goodbye like Vivi did. He got a one little tiny panel in the corner. But we got, we get, did we get like a double page or a full page spread of Luffy gear third palming Urashima? You know, like, why is that getting the big star panel but the, the, climactic finish of the arc the 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 emotional height the the goodbye the the tearful goodbye to our dear friend that we've spent four arcs with that gets a tiny panel that that's what i'm talking about with pacing pacing and panel usage is very important so you know um an arc needs to do that well if it's going to keep people invested if it's going to if it's going to and not only keep people invested but it also goes for the end of the arc if the ending is poorly paced or if it's rushed then the ending is going to feel like it was cheap and it's going to feel like it undercut all the buildup and then it won't be as satisfying when you get to the end because the ending wasn't satisfying you know it didn't satisfy the buildup that took 100 chapters so that's really um a big big point uh it needs character development so here's another element of a good arc character development we need the Straw Hats, and I, I, by character development, I, I mean mostly protagonists. A good arc will have moments that develop the protags of the story, where the protagonists can grow, right? The Straw Hats are not static characters. They don't stay the exact same start to finish in the story. They either grow mentally or physically. They either get stronger by fighting someone, and they, or they discover something about themselves. And, and a lot of the time, these go hand in hand. Oftentimes a character will learn something about themselves or make some sort of, you know, have some sort of epiphany and this will lead into better, better combat. This will, this will lead to their physical upgrade. This will lead to them getting some kind of power up. So I think character development is super important. Having characters, having us learn something new about our protagonists, having our protagonists change in some meaningful way for the better, uh, or, or demonstrate that the characters are growing, I think is super important. 
Um, Marine Ford, one of the biggest, biggest positives of Marine Ford. You know, everyone looks at Marine Ford and they're like, well, it's such an epic battle. There's all these different factions and all that coming together and it's a big battle and there's all this, all these stakes and tension and characters are dying. That's all true. Those are all big reasons why Marine Ford's incredible. One of the biggest reasons Marine Ford is incredible to me is because of the character development, specifically with Luffy. I think Marine Ford would be three points lower off of everyone's list if it weren't for the fact that Luffy underwent major, major changes by the end of the arc. Mar Marine Ford woke Luffy up. It completely changed his worldview. It shattered his worldview. He experienced real consequences and Luffy had to grow from that and change and, and improve. And he, he, you know, we, we saw Luffy get pushed to his absolute limit in that arc and we had to see him adjust to that. Luffy couldn't just strong arm his way through the fights. He needed the help of everyone around him. Luffy needed to accept help from former antagonists. Our pro tag had to team up with former bad guys in order to accomplish his goal. That's character development. Luffy had to accept help from Ivankov on multiple occasions, from Whitebeard. He had to he had to put his life on the line. He had to separate from his crew and he had to agree to meet with his crew two years in the future because he realized he wasn't ready. He realized they're not ready for the new world and he had to, he had to put his journey on hold. When have we ever seen Luffy put the journey on hold? When have we ever seen Luffy say, okay, becoming Pirate King is not the most important thing right this moment. Only in Marine Ford. Only in Summit War, that whole saga. Luffy, for the first time in the story, had to readjust his trajectory, sideline his goal so that he could become stronger. That's growth. That's character development. That's why Marine Ford is so damn good. If it didn't have that, it would be way worse. If it was just an epic war with no consequences and Luffy just got out of the war and let's say he saved Ace, or even if he didn't save Ace, if Luffy, if Ace died and Luffy was just like, fuck. This sucks. He gets a little cry out. He's like, all right, on with the journey. Let's go. Let's meet up and continue. We got to, we got to beat the, the world government now. Like if Luffy was, if Ace died and Luffy was just like, oh, Akainu. And then he gets together with his crew and he's like, we got to go beat him. Like that, that would suck. But it's because Luffy had that realization that he's not good enough yet. That made that arc so good. That made that arc so compelling. So character development's important. Here's another one. Water 7 Enius Lobby. Who got character development in that arc? Usopp. Massive, massive, giant, giant goldfish-sized character development. Elbaf-sized character development for Usopp. Usopp did a complete 180 on his character. Up until Water 7, he was always fighting to be the captain of the crew, bullshitting, you know, having these, like, jokes about, you know, his, his all of his men that would follow under Captain Usopp and all this stuff. Usopp got really humbled by Water 7. He didn't want to detach from Mary because Mary was a symbol of Usopp. Mary was the symbol of what Usopp was. It was the ship was gifted to them by Usopp's childhood best friend, by Kaya. Okay? That was Kaya's gift to Usopp, technically. And the Mary was falling apart. The Mary wasn't able to continue the journey anymore. And Usopp could relate to that. Usopp felt like the weak link. Usopp felt like, hey, you know, the Mary is not good enough anymore. And they're, they want to abandon Mary. What's going to happen when I'm not good enough? Are they going to abandon me? We never got that lens into Usopp's character prior to that arc. We never saw that side of him. But for the first time, we saw Usopp accepting that, hey, I'm like the weakest link in the crew. Like, I can't fight like the other guys. I can't navigate like Nami. I can't fight like Zoro. I can't cook like Sanji. I can't lead like Luffy. I'm the weak link. What do I do? They want to get rid of Mary because Mary can't keep going. What happens when they feel that way about me? Are they going to just abandon me? That's why he fought Luffy over that. To see Usopp turn on his captain, leave the crew temporarily, fight Luffy, because he wanted to prove a point. He wanted to prove to himself. He wanted to prove to himself that he was good enough, and he couldn't. By the end of it, Luffy beat him, and he couldn't prove that to himself. So he took the Mary and left. 
And then he was so ashamed by this decision and he realized how stupid he was being because it was made clear to him when he met Frankie. It was made clear that they love him. They're his friends. And how could Usopp have taken that for granted and thought so low of his own friends and his crew that he thought they would abandon him over something minor? He didn't realize that, yeah, truly the Mary was done. The Mary took them as far as it could and that was the end of the road. And when Usopp had this realization, he felt ashamed. So ashamed, in fact, that he couldn't show his face to his crew. He was determined to help them because he loved them and he cared about them, but he didn't want to do it as Usopp. Because he was too ashamed of his decision, and he was also too prideful with his decision. He was like, I have to, in a way, he was ashamed to show his face and too prideful to admit that he was wrong. So he had to do it on, in the guise of this character, Soge King, and he created this whole fictional character that like embodies what Usopp is in his mind, or like in his dreams, like this brave warrior of the sea. That's what Soge King is. He made a whole song and for him and everything. He's a superhero from a t uh, TV show. So Usopp had to create this persona to cope with his decisions and to cope with his uh, incompetence and his pride and that's character development. Robin went from this mysterious woman who wasn't really talking much, who wasn't able to really like, she wanted to fit in with the crew, but wasn't willing to give herself all away to the crew just yet because she didn't trust anyone enough and she was afraid to hurt them and she was afraid to be the reason that they died. And then they get Robin kidnapped and she, you know, she's, you guys know, you guys know what I'm talking about because you guys love the arc as much as I do. But the point I'm trying to make is that character development is a must have. If you want your arc to be big and compelling and, and to, and to hit hard, you need the pro tags to move too. It can't just be the villain it can't just be the world the pro tags have to grow and change so character development next world building now this kind of ties into the interesting relevant location but I think this is this is not just related to the locale world building in general I'm referring to here so what makes a good arc an arc that expands the world of one piece in a meaningful way not just by location but with information with lore okay we get to an arc that introduces an entirely new faction that we weren't even really considering before. That's huge. We get to an arc that, that establishes the dynamics of a Yonko crew or, or establishes something about the ancient kingdom or the lore of the world. The people of an island that have a deep connection to the lore of that island and how that relates to the void century or the, um, sorry, I got to blow my nose. Give me a second. Let me grab a tissue. I'll be right back. So, sorry about that. I don't know if this happens to anyone else, but if you ever talk for a long time, your nose gets stuffy. My nose gets stuffy when I talk a lot. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so world building. World building is super important. You need to have the you need to have the arc give you deep insight into the world at large to expand make the world feel larger. Not only like the lore, but just the, lo the location, like make it, make the world feel more significant and large and intertwined and, and, and have the world feel more lived in and real. Um, so world building is huge and a lot of arcs check this box. I think that's one of the biggest strengths of Oda's writing is that nearly, nearly every arc in one piece does a great amount of world building. Some of them fall short. Some, for example, Punk Hazard, I think, falls short. I think Punk Hazard really doesn't do much for world building at all. Uh, it does. It, it really only introduces two, two or three important elements, and that is uh, showing what happened with the Marines after the time skip. You know what happened with the decision to make the next fleet admiral, and then the fact that Aokiji and Akainu's Aoki, their fight change the entire landscape of the island um what else uh that caesar is creating smile devil fruits for for kaido so that there, there's artificial devil fruits being distributed and i guess the only other piece of world building you get from that arc is uh yeah the gigantification experiments i guess the fact the fact that it was a a, a prior lab of vegapunk i guess uh is is a plus in that regard but i think overall like it doesn't really do much like, I feel like if you removed Punk Hazard from the story, 
uh, you wouldn't really miss much. For example, the Vegapunk lab thing. I mean, we're getting that now with Egghead, right? Like, does Punk Hazard really expand on the world much with Vegapunk's lab, considering that we have an entire dedicated arc to meeting Vegapunk on his main lab? Right? Like, there's nothing that Punk Hazard offers that's new at that point. I know that Egghead came later, but realistically, if you got rid of Punk Hazard, uh, you could still have Egghead and have that locale covered, have that theme covered, all that's still covered by Egghead. Um, you know, the law stuff, all the law in Doflamingo and teaming up to take down a Yonko, I feel like that could have easily happened in Dress Rosa and it would have made no difference. Not to, obviously, I'm not rewriting the story here, but I'm just saying that, you know, Punk Hazard, it does world build every arc in One Piece. Don't get me wrong. Every arc has world building and, and every arc has developments. Some, arc have, some arcs have more than others, and some arcs have more significant the developments than others. Uh, and I think that there's some that are weaker. Um, what's another arc that isn't too big on world building? I would say... Uh, you know, Thriller Bark... I hate to keep picking on the same arcs here, but Thriller Bark kind of doesn't do much world building. Uh, it's, it's very minor, I feel like, a lot of it. You have, you know, the stuff with Wano and Ryuma... Uh, you have the Big Mom Viva card, but that's not really, like, explicitly clear when you're actually reading the arc, so it doesn't add that much. Um, and Ores. That's pretty much it. Uh, <laughs> Syrup Village, but, you know, I'm not gonna harp on Syrup Village too much. Um, like I said, there's not that many that don't do much world building. I think maybe Amazon Lily d lacks in the world building aspect a little bit. Although, you know, it's unique. Island full of women, like Amazonian warriors, the celestial dragon stuff, the tattoo. Like there's some stuff, but like I said, some do it more than others. Uh, arcs that do a lot of world building, and this is why these arcs are so beloved. Uh, Marine Ford does a ton of world building because we get to see all these factions at play. We get to see all these things come together. Literally, the entire world is going to war in one arc. It's like, you know, it's huge. We learn so much. In that entire arc, we learn so much about individual people, characters, their powers, what they can do, the magnitude of what they're capable of, alliances. We, you know, we we formally meet uh, Akainu for the first time. Um, it's it's huge. Uh, so for world building, it's big. Zo Zo is a huge world building arc. It's all world building basically. Like there's not that much of a conflict. Jack is not the most compelling villain ever. It's Zo is like mostly world building. It's like all world building. Egghead so much world building there's so much being revealed to us in egghead the different cutaways to different islands and 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 then the flashbacks i mean the amount of world building is huge in egghead that's why people love it people love skypea for the same reason skypea ha adds so much to the world despite feeling disconnected it has so many connections to so many other things and it's the best part about Skypea is that it's not even obvious when you're reading it how important it is. And the payoff is throughout the story. Every single arc to some degree has some kind of Skypea payoff. And I love that because Skypea is an arc that pays you the further you, in you get. The more you progress through the story, the more Skypea pays off. And I think that's great. It's great for that reason. So um, world building is big, and I think arcs benefit from that a lot as well. If they have a really, really solid amount of world building, they add a lot to the world. That's a big, big positive. And lastly, this is the last point. Hard-hitting, climax, and payoff. The ending. The end of the arc. The peak and the end. The, the, journey, from, the journey to the top of the, the climax. The climax moment. And then how the rest of the arc resolves. The arc needs to have... A hard-hitting climax, one that moves you, one that makes you feel something. I'm thinking Luffy getting knocked over by Rob Lucci after the Six King gun and then not falling on his back and landing on his feet and then standing up and with the last ounce of strength he has doing a Jet Gatling and, and then thinking back to Rob and saying, I want to live. Thinking back to all the things that, you know, Lucci said, you're never going to see your friend again. Usopp shouting for Luffy, Luffy, get up, Luffy, get up. Luffy fucking Jet Gatlings Luchi into the fucking wall. And Luchi gets taken out and he gets fucking blown through the wall. And they're like, Rob Luchi, the prodigy. He lost. And then the, the, the come down off of that with, uh, you know, the party on Water 7. Meeting Garp and Kobe and it's all big congratulations. And Aokiji's like, ha, 
they defeated us and he meets Robin behind the wall and he's like, Robin, I want to see what kind of person you become. I'm going to let you live. You know, uh, I'm, I'm going to trust in Saul's decision. And there's this whole party and then the, you know, the, the tearful goodbye and, and the, oh, and the merry and the going merry burning and say everyone's saying goodbye to the merry. That is a climax. That is a payoff. Everything building up to that moment, all those moments in the entire arc, everything that happened in Water 7 and Aeneas Lobby was made just for this, just for that Lucci defeat, the escape from Aeneas Lobby, Mary dying, getting back to Water 7, throwing a massive party with everyone involved, Aokiji forgiving Robin and, and letting her go and trusting in Saul, Luffy meeting his grandfather and, and, and showing us, hey, Luffy, you're becoming like, you're, you're becoming a fucking, you're becoming a big dog now. You're becoming an important guy, you know? Kobe coming back, getting to see Kobe again after all this time, you know, all that payoff right at the end was, was so damn good. And it was all just a, a total like answer. It was a, a perfect answer to everything that happened prior in the arc. Frankie joining the crew, building them their new ship because the arc started with them looking for a shipwright to fix the Mary. And it ends with them getting a new ship and losing Mary. And Frankie building them a new ship. They take their ship. Frankie jumps on board and they're out. That's the end. Oh, and then Luf uh, Usopp's apology. Usopp's apology as they're sailing away. It's such a perfect resolution. The climax and the resolution are perfect. That makes a good arc. Arcs need that to make everything else feel worth it. And this is why I put it at the end. Because... If every arc, if, if if everything on this list happens in an arc, but the climax and payoff sucks, everything else is weakened. This is like the drum beat in a song. You know how they say the drummer is like the most important uh, member of a band? It's, be it's because the drummer maintains the rhythm. The drummer maintains the tempo. The drummer is the heartbeat of the music. It's all kind of... It's, it all kind of revolves around the beat and the tempo and the pace. So, in my opinion, the payoff and the climax of an arc is like the drum beat of an arc. It's the thing that the arc is building up to, it wants to reach. Every arc is trying to build up to and reach a satisfying payoff. And this can make or break an arc in a lot of cases. Wano suffered because of its payoff. The climax was great, I think, with Gear 5 and that fight, but the way that the rest of the fight kind of came to a very quick end, the way that uh, they kind of just left the island very, very quickly, didn't even have like a very strong goodbye with Momo. Um, it just felt like very rushed. And I, I still love the final sequence of Onigashima, but the ending in general, like the way the entire arc paid off, it just didn't feel like it was enough considering it's 150 chapters guys remember the arc is 150 chapters by far the longest individual arc in one piece and for all that build up the payoff was really underwhelming and we can also talk about how luffy won the fight right because oda said with kaido kaido was such a problem for luffy that luffy wouldn't be able to just defeat kaido with a punch like he like Oda was like, oh, I'm, I'm not sure how Luffy's going to defeat Kaido because Kaido's really strong. Luffy's going to have to figure out a way to beat Kaido that isn't just a big punch. And lo and behold, what happened at the end of Wano? Luffy beats Kaido with a giant punch. So there was also that expectation that Luffy was going to have to find some creative or interesting or unique way to win. But he didn't. Uh, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna put that as like a ma major thing, but I'm just using this to illustrate, I just want to use this to illustrate the point I'm making that the climax didn't, it didn't hit as hard as it could have, I think. So for me, like having a bad climax, having a bad payoff, or maybe not even a bad, but just underwhelming or unsatisfying can really hurt an arc. I think big time. Um... Yeah, Zunisha pulling up Thomas. That was a uh, that was unnecessary. That was very unnecessary. I don't know what Zunisha was there for. It didn't really accomplish anything. Just to say, Joy Boy is back. Whatever. Um, but you know, there's arcs that have amazing climaxes. Ennius Lobby was one. 
I think Dressrosa is another. I'll give it to Dressrosa. Dressrosa had a phenomenal climax and ending. Regardless of if you didn't like the co the Colosseum, if you thought the the Thunder Soldier Rebecca stuff was a little bit tired and repetitive, the way Dressrosa ended was fantastic. Everything from Gear 4 being the first time we got a, a new gear since pre-time skip, since Water 7. Now we're calling back to Water 7, the king that we've been talking about the whole stream. The new gear, Luffy turning it up, beating up Doflamingo, having to take out Bellamy. Bellamy having a change of art. That's character development, by the way. Note that. Bellamy doing a complete 180 on his character and actually re coming to respect Luffy. And Luffy having to redo the punch on Bellamy, but this time, like... Like, he doesn't want to. Like, he actually likes Bellamy. And then because of that, compelling villain, compelling conflict, compelling victims. Luffy is upset at Doflamingo. He's like, you fucker. Like, I can't believe you're doing this to me. You're forcing me to, to, to hurt my own friends. Everything from... Gear 4, beating up Doflamingo, the birdcage, Dofi wanting to kill everybody, Luffy doing the King Kong gun, and then have, and then that line from Luffy where he says, you just want to control everything, you want to have your hands in everything, and it's suffocating me. Like, I, you never hear Luffy talk like that, bro. Like, Luffy being like, like, literally surrounded by the cage, and it's like, you want to control everything, you're suffocating me. Disappear. Fucking King Kong gun. Sends Doflamingo into the plaza. Sends him into the ground. Back down into the underworld. The secret underworld that Doflamingo was having people enslaved him. Sending him into the pits where he belongs. The announcer from the Coliseum. Announcing Lucy as the winner. Lucy did it! Lucy's the winner! He took him down! The whole fucking island cheering. Luffy wanting to leave the island getting the grand fleet in the process all the people he met over the course of the arc everyone in the coliseum all those characters swearing fealty to their pirate king doing a toast for sake giving luffy a fleet comparable to whitebeards bro doing a big toast talking about how they respect and love luffy and they admire luffy they want him to lead them they were so impressed by his actions. All those characters that got introduced in the Coliseum that in any, any other arc you would have thought, these are just filler characters. Who cares about these guys? Why are they here? No, you should care about them because they're in the Straw Hat Grand Fleet now. They're Luffy's sub-captains. And then on the goodbye, having Fujitora hold the rubble over them and then like picturing Luffy in his mind, he's like... He lets Luffy go because he can feel that the people of the country are thankful to Luffy and they're happy and they and they 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 think of Luffy as a hero. And then that line from Fujitora, I wish I hadn't blinded myself. I really would love to see your face. I wonder what it would look like. I bet you look kind. Bro, that gets me tearing up every time. That's a goodbye comparable, in my opinion, almost on the level of Vivi holding up the arm. To the straw hats which is another fantastic phenomenal climax by the way that's why alabasta is so good because of the, partly because of that ending it's like the best moment the single best moment of the alabasta arc is that goodbye one of the best moments of dress rosa is fujitora seeing luffy off it's so damn good and that speaks to what i'm saying here you need to have that hard-hitting climax, that payoff, that payoff that really makes you feel something. It makes the entire arc feel good. It makes it feel worth it. Like, you, the time that you spent reading this was well spent because, damn, that payoff tasted like, like exquisite, fine cuisine. We're talking, we're talking sirloin steak, medium, medium well, maybe medium if you're, if you want a little bit more bloody. Perfect sear on both sides. With a nice little garnish. Nice little steak sauce on the side, baby. If you're feeling a little bit, you want some more flavor. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Michelin gourmet meals here. That's what a good climax gives you. It makes you feel like the entire meal was worth it. All this, you know what it is? Here, let's, let's go with this food analogy here. I know some people hate food analogies. You, you go to a dinner. You go to a dinner. You go to a really nice restaurant. You're spending a lot of money at this restaurant. They take a long time to cook the food, but you know, it, it, it's going to taste good. The waiting, the wait for the food is going to be worth it because it's going to taste good at the end of the day, right? So you, you get your appetizer. You start, you look at the menu, you're looking at the menu, you're seeing what's, what's, what it's all about, what food's available. 
You place your order. They bring you your drinks. You get your drinks. Sipping on your drink. This is great. Okay, good. Then the appetizer comes. You get the appetizer. You're like, okay, this is great. This is holding me over until I get my actual meal that I ordered. And then like 40 minutes later to an hour later, you finally get the food. Now tell me, if if everything else, if the appetizer and the drinks were great, but the, the main course sucks, are you going to be satisfied with your dinner? Probably not. When you get the food, you finally get the food. You need you need the food to be so good that it made the wait worth it. It made the drinks and the appetizers and the wait up until you get the food. It, me it needs to be worth it. That's what the climax and the payoff is. The climax and the payoff is the the main course and the dessert. You know, the post the post arcs, like the post war arc, the post Eddie's lobby arc. Those are the, the that's the dessert, the cherry on top. You beat Rob Lucci. We said goodbye to Mary. Okay, now let's spend 10 chapters talking to Garp, partying, getting our new bounties, uh, setting off on the new ship. That's the dessert. That's the that's the extra... You have a little extra room in your stomach for something good? Here's something sweet. Little cherry on top. That's what an arc needs to accomplish. It needs to make that wait for the main meal worth it. And if, if it doesn't do that, then it's going to make the rest of the meal feel like it's not fucking worth... Why was it worth... Why did I spend my time on this? Why did I spend my money on this? Why did I care if the if the steak sucked? Uh, if the steak was too dry, you know? So we've got this list set up now. We're, we're already at like an hour and a half into the stream. So now that we have this list, I wanna just quickly run through some arcs um, that we were bringing up earlier when I asked you guys this question, you know, which is the which are the best arcs, which are the worst arcs? Let's see how much of this list each of those arcs hit. So, uh, let's say for a good arc, we had out, let's start with Alabasta. Well, Alabasta has a very interesting and relevant location because the location of Alabasta is hyped up for 50 chapters. Practically it's Vivi's homeland. It's one that we keep hearing about from this person. They recruited onto the crew. It's this big kingdom. It's actually one of the biggest islands in the grand line scale wise. Um, is it, you know, the, the visually, I have to knock it for the same reasons I knock Wano, where Wano is just feudal Japan. Alabasta is just like Arabian Nights, like, you know, like Middle East, Egypt mixed in with there with a little bit of India influence. It's just kind of, it's a little bit plain visually, but at least the location is relevant and it was sufficiently hyped up and it has a lot of like stuff that's related to the world. You know, it's the, it's the home base of baroque works right now it has an ongoing civil war it's a very vast country that they have to travel around they have to spend a lot of time going from city to city it's a very they have to cover a lot of ground um you almost forget that they're they're pirates for a little bit because they spend so much time on this giant giant island on foot traveling through the desert there's all these interesting creatures right let's not forget this is something i feel like oda forgets uh to do in the more recent arcs guys the animals the animals, the fighting dugongs, the crab, the camel in Alabasta, right? That was something Oda used to do a lot of. He used to int introduce like the local wildlife. We have a, we have a giant crab that like only runs sideways. We have the fighting the fighting dugongs. You know they 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 train karate. They have um. You know the fucking they have to they have to have Chopper talk to the camel to like you know help them get around. You have uh, Karoo, Vivi's Vivi's duck, and Karoo and all of Karoo's friends. And then you get to Skypia, right? And you have you have the octopus that helps carry them down from the clouds. And you have uh, you have the wolves in the forest. Oh yeah, the banana crocodiles in Alabasta. Yeah, in Skypia you have the wolves in the forest that they dance with and they have a little celebration with. You have the south birds that lead them that always point south Oda used to really really include like a lot of wildlife to like liven up his locations he has not done that lately I'm gonna be real that's a big big minus on post time skip um, Oda has not been giving islands like that many animals I think the the last time I can think of that he did it really was Dressrosa with the uh, the the fighting fish like the bullfish um, I, I, I don't know why I'm forgetting what they're called. I, 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 I know this normally. I'm blanking. But, like, he had, like, the fighting the, the fighting fish that were, like, near Green Bit. Uh, and, uh, 
Was there anything else? Maybe not. Maybe that was it. I guess the Tontada, I guess, because they're like a unique race that live on an island in a bunch of mushrooms. But, you know, the point I'm trying to make is that, like, Alabasta did have a lot of interesting factors. Even though if the, the visually, like, the location was not that original, it had all this weird wildlife and all these different things that made it interesting. Compelling villain. Crocodile is a compelling villain. I, I feel like we don't need to go into this uh, in, in depth. Parvision, what's up, bro? He said, Hidden Blunts, happy post 420. Thank you, bro. Hidden D Blunts. Don't forget the D. I'm a D clan. <laughs> Uh, happy, yeah, happy post 420, bro. Go Knicks. We cooked yesterday. Tomorrow we got game two. It's going to be fire. Can't wait for that. Uh, I'm going to be at the edge of my seat. Uh, I Actually, I, I didn't realize I do have my gaming stream tomorrow. I might have to reschedule that depending on what time the game is at because I have to watch that. I'm not going to be streaming. If I'm, if I'm streaming Persona while the game's going on, I'm going to be hating Persona. So <laughs> I might have to reschedule that, but we'll see. Um, yeah, the, the victims... Uh, the victims in Alabasta were compelling. We get, we developed that relationship with Vivi. We developed that relationship with Cobra. We have Koza, you know, with the revolutionaries that are in Alabasta wanting to start a civil war. We have, uh, the old man in, uh, Yuba. Uh, I think that was the name of the town that like he, he was working hard digging into the ground to find water. And, and we find out ultimately that crocodile was the reason that he was getting no water in town. And then later on crocodile sent a sand tornado, a storm on the way to that town, uh, to Toto. Yes. Thank you, Derek Toto. He sent the tornado. Like, like there was all these, um, there were these things that made us care about the people that lived in Alabasta. We had a direct care for them. And that's also partially because Vivi constantly expressed how much she cared for her people. And that rubbed off on us. So, yeah. Compelling villain. Compelling victims. Compelling conflict as a result of that. Good pacing. I would say Alabasta has some pacing issues here and there. But overall, the pacing is pretty solid, pretty fast, consistent. Uh, from start to finish there's not like any time in the arc that spent too much on anything in particular I would say maybe the beginning of Alabasta has some pacing issues here and there, but overall it's solid Character development character development is there the, the Vivi's development is there Sanji with the mr. Prince stuff totally totally there um Luffy and Smoker and being stuck in the cage together and then Smoker like having a little bit of a change of heart on Luffy and at the end of the arc you know after having had to work together with Luffy he he's like a little bit tight at the world government for wanting to give the marines credit he's like hey I uh I didn't do this this is all straw hat you have to give him the credit uh yes Zoro learning to cut steel huge Zoro learning how to cut steel the breath of all things flashback all that stuff um, Nami getting the climb attack. That was the first time Nami got the climb attack was in Alabasta. Guys, it had a lot of development, it had a lot of character development. World building? Don't even get me started. We're talking about Alabasta even now with Lily, Nefertari, D. Lily, Nefertari, D. Cobra, D. Vivi, Pluton, the Poneglyphs, one of the ninth, one of the 20 kingdoms, the one that stayed behind. Alabasta is huge for lore, huge for world building. And the hard hitting climax and payoff. I mean, we just talked about it, right? Luffy defeating Crocodile, learning to use his, his own blood as a way to counter Crocodile's powers, launching Crocodile through the fucking ground into the streets. Vivi from the top of the tower screaming to all of her people, please stop fighting. Please stop fighting. Please stop fighting. Crocodile gets launched out of the concrete into the sky. He's defeated. And with his defeat, as Vivi's shouting, the rain comes down finally. The rain that they've been longing for, the rain that they were fighting for has returned. And because the rain comes down, everyone stops screaming. Everyone stops fighting. And now the only thing they can hear is the sound of the, the pitter-patter of the raindrops and Vivi alone on the tower shouting to her people, Please stop fighting. Tatakayo yamete kudasai. At the top of her lungs. And that's the only sound left. And they stop the fighting. And then Vivi gives her goodbye to the Straw Hats and tells them that she needs to stay behind with her people to help them build a better tomorrow. 
but she can't say goodbye because the world government can't know she's a pirate. So what does she do? She holds up the sign of their friendship, the X mark. Guys, that's a climax. That is a payoff. That's a finish. Not every arc manages, manages to do that in one piece. So, you know, you have other arcs that are more in between. You have other arcs that don't manage to check off all the boxes. Skypea has an interesting and relevant location, for sure. That's one of the biggest strengths of the arc. It has a compelling villain. The victims aren't so compelling. I don't really care much for the people of Skypea individually. Um, I don't really care, care for, what's his name, Pagaya. Uh, I care more for Wiper. I care for the Shandorans. I don't care much for the Skypean. So the, the, the victims are a mixed bag. The conflict is pretty solid. I actually like the conflict itself. The conflict between the Shandorans and the Skypeans. These two factions going at it. And then the third faction with the invaders, NL and his, his uh, god knights, right? Um, taking over. And um, yeah, I think that's... I think the conflict's pretty compelling. The pacing, here's the big X... On, on Skypea, the pacing's not good. Skypea has terrible pacing. Um, too much of the beginning of the arc is spent just wandering around, dealing with like the foot soldiers on, on the beach in front of Skypea. They get into the forest and then they gotta do the trials. And the trials involve, you gotta fight, uh, what's his name? The ball guy, the guy who could turn into balls, okay? Ball guy? guys remember his name I, I i struggle to remember it from time to time sasori is not sasori that's the naruto character um shit whatever the fact that they have to spend time fighting ball guy and having these little satori satori thank you they gotta fight ball guy they gotta i'm gonna just gonna call him ball guy fuck him <laughs> they gotta fight a ball guy they gotta have little scraps with wiper here and there they're wandering through the woods they do you know they 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 have to set up camp and then they have to look at the map and find shandora it's nice it feels like a big adventure where they're looking for this mystical hidden city but at the same time a lot of this runtime does kind of make the arc feel slow and by the time we do get to fight anel it like it feels like it's at the tail end of the arc you know um, especially in the anime, it's way worse, the pacing, but that's an anime only issue. So for me, I think Skypea takes a hit on pacing, but it's good in every other department. The character development is, I would say the character development is, the characters are a little bit static for Skypea, if I'm going to be real. Uh, Luffy doesn't change much from the beginning to the end of Skypea. Most, most of the people don't change much. I'd say all the development comes from Robin mainly. Uh, Robin and her archaeological stuff because th that's the first time Robin was a part of the crew really was in Skypea Alabasta she was a villain so if anything uh, Skypea was a big turning point for Robin because she went from villain to working along with the crew in that arc and she got to really show her strengths in that arc her love for archaeology her hatred for those who disrespect history that came up a lot uh, I guess you could also give it to Usopp uh, giving Usopp the development in Skypea, you know, with the Club Outerman and, and some of that stuff. You know, there's a little bit of that there. But, uh, you know, character development was a little bit, it was a little static in Skypea. But the world building was incredible. Skypea had incredible world building. And um, just a lot of, like, new things got introduced in Skypea. Mantra, which would later become Hockey, got introduced in Skypea. Like, there's all these things that we, we get, we get to learn about through Skypea, uh, even though it's so isolated. Um, the knock-up stream, you know, the combo with Jaya, the knock-up stream, uh, the fact that there are Sky Islands out there, the fact that there's an entire race of people with wings out there, the whole thing with Anel, and then Anel tells us about Burka, another Sky Island that he destroyed, and now we might think there are other characters from Burka, like a Rouge, in current timeline that, you know, um, Everything with the Poneglyphs that show up at the end of the arc, the Golden Bell, the Ancient Shandorans, the Nolan flashback, and all that stuff. It's There's a ton of world building. Amazing, amazing backstory. I guess we could add good flashbacks somewhere in this list. I feel like we could kind of lump that in with any of these, but, you know, as a, as a, a little runner-up to the what makes a good One Piece arc list, I guess you could put good flashback, at least one good flashback on there. Um, so... You know, good world building. And then once again, guys, Skypea's climax is unmatched. It's so damn good. Luffy defeating NL, punching the bell, saying, hey, did you hear that? Cricket, you know, Nolan, did you hear that? 
Did you hear that, old man? Luffy's shadow in the sky having defeated Anel? That whole mystery of the shadows in the sky becoming clear? That whole message being sent down to Jaya? It was a beautiful, beautiful ending. And then to top it all off, the, the payoff, the finish to the arc, where they're leaving the island and they read the golden poneglyph that has Roger's writing on it. This is the first time the Straw Hats have had any direct interaction in any way with the Roger Pirates, no matter how tangential it is. Roger's writing on a poneglyph, and they found it. They found, they were like, Roger was here. Roger basically wrote, I was here on the side of a poneglyph, and the Straw Hats got to see that. That's huge. That's insane for the payoff. That's for, Imagine a reader, you're being told all about Gold Roger up until this arc, and he's just like a figment of history, and then here we are, a, a, a tangible, real piece of evidence of where Roger had been during his adventures. Huge for the payoff. Huge for the payoff. So, yeah, Skypea has that. It has that. That's why Skypea is great. Water 7 literally has everything. Water 7 NES Lobby has everything on this list. There's, I'm not going to debate this. This is... I, I, I don't think most people would even want to debate this. Uh... Uh, Thriller Bark we talked about earlier. Location's not so relevant, but it is interesting. The villain kind of sucks. The victims kind of suck. The conflict, therefore, kind of sucks. Uh, the pacing's okay. I think the pacing's actually pretty bad at, throughout Thriller Bark in some parts, especially when you're dealing with, like, the zombie shenanigans and Hogback and, I don't know, there's some pacing issues. There is character development. There's really good... Actually, one of the best parts about Thriller Bark is the character development. Uh, Zoro's character development. Brooke... Uh, and and the entire like development of Brooke becoming a straw hat and joining the crew and his backstory um, Luffy's character development by the end of the arc, especially, you know uh, You know with the the nightmare Luffy and that kind of like maybe inspiring him to to create uh, Gear 4 later there there's all the stuff with oars and the straw hats having to work together as a team to take down oars They hadn't really had to work together to face a single enemy prior to that so there's a lot of good character development in that regard. Zoro's character development with Ryuma. Um, what else? Asanji. We learn about Sanji's uh, dream devil fruit that he's wanted his entire life. And that power ends up playing a factor into the raid suit later in the story. We have, um, you know, Nami and Lola's interactions. It's like minor character development here and there. Chopper. We get a lot of development with Chopper. Chopper had some great development in Thriller Bark with Hogback. And... We get to get this insight into, like, Chopper's beliefs as a doctor and what he thinks is morally right and wrong to do as a doctor. I love that. That's actually one of the best moments of character development for Chopper. Um, world building. We get... Like I said, it's not the most relevant location, so we don't get that much world building. But we do get some, like, in the form of ores, uh, all the Kuma stuff. Um, what else? I guess Lola being connected to Big Mom, it's like, hey, my, my mom's a big pirate in the New World, here's her Viva card, you know, that ended up playing a big factor later, you know, playing, playing a big part. Uh, the Florian Triangle definitely is another piece of world building I think Thriller Bark adds, for sure. Uh, so it had some decent world building, but uh, the, the, the climax and payoff, yeah, it was, it was good. I, I would say the climax and payoff was not incredible. I'm not really thinking too hard back onto how Lo Luffy beats Gecko Moria. That's not like a highlight moment of the story for me. Uh, but I do think back to Kuma a lot. I think I think back a lot to Kuma. And let's also not forget, guys, when did Brooks' flashback happen? It happened at the payoff end of the arc. It happened at the end. We had Brook working with us and helping us the entire arc. And Luffy wanted him to join the crew. And he's like, yeah, I'll join your crew as long as you help me. And... Uh, we don't get really any development on Brooke until the very, very end. And it's only after the arc's over. We're in the come down from the arc. Zoro did his thing. Nothing happened. And then Luffy's sitting on the piano listening to Brooke play the music. And then Brooke pulls out, out of his skull, he pulls out the, do the tone dial and then plays the song. And then we get the flashback. And then we get Brooke's full story right at the end. And I think this counts as payoff and climax, because think about it. We don't really know why we're helping Brooke the whole arc, like, on a deeper level. Like, we haven't really had that time to get attached to Brooke. We didn't, um... 
we didn't get to know Brooks' whole deal. You know, how he became a skeleton, like how all this really worked, what exactly happened with him. And then we get at the very end of the arc, this insane, insane, incredible, one of the best flashbacks in the entire story with Bink Sake, Laboon, connecting back to Laboon all the way back at the entrance to the Grand Line, guys. This is, that's insane. The Laboon connection, the Bink Sake thing. Brooke's entire backstory, that's all the payoff. That's the dessert of the arc right there. To end with that, to top off the meal, you get that nice dessert. Incredible. That's what made the, the end of Thriller Bark so memorable. It was the combo of Kuma and Brooke's backstory that really made it hit home. That's why everyone loves, that, that's what everyone loves about Thriller Bark, if we're being real. Uh, Marine Ford, Summit War, I'm, I'm not even going to spend time talking about this. We already, we already know hits every hits everything here pretty much um fishman island i was hyping up at the beginning of the stream i think the interesting and relevant location yes it does it hits that very interesting location very relevant location very unique location beautiful awesome good compelling villain this is the weakest part of fishman island i think the villain is the, is the worst part uh, so Hody, not the most compelling villain. Vanderdecken, not the most compelling. Actually, Vanderdecken sucks pretty hard. So Hody and Vanderdecken are not great villains. Um, the victims are compelling. The flashbacks, Fisher Tiger, Jimbe, um, you know, all the people of Fishman Island, Papag, Papag and fucking Hachi. They're, they're all people that we care about to a degree, right? Not so much Papag, but... We care about these characters, uh, and the victims are compelling. The backstories, the 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 flashbacks, they are compelling. Otohime is a compelling character. Shirahoshi, all that stuff, everything with Poseidon, that whole flashback, the celestial dragon getting stra stranded on Fishman Island, Otohime helping, getting shot while trying to bring them to the surface, Fisher Tiger going to the surface, and working with his crew. We get to see Arlong again. This is all compelling, incredibly well written. The victims and the conflict are good. The villain sucks. But these two factors are good in Fishman Island. The conflict, the whole human fish fishman relation thing, the, the cycle of hatred, the, the whole like Hody trying to like turn Fishman Island to a hub of like hatred against humans and wants to go on a crusade and genocide humans. That's all good. But Hody himself is not very compelling. He just feels like a repeat of Arlong, just cranked up to 11. Uh, Vanderdecken is just ass, total ass, weird, creep. Like his whole conflict, his whole fucking motive is to marry a child. It's so bizarre. I hate it. I hate Vanderdecken. Um, totally fucking sucks. I'm just gonna harp on this again. Vanderdecken sucks ass. You fool! Fuck you, Vanderdecken. Uh, pacing. Fishman Island has good pacing. It actually does. People, you know, watch the anime, they think P Fishman has terrible pacing. In the manga, it's paced great. The arc is short. Fishman Island is what, 50 chapters? I think it's like 50 chapters long. Fishman Island is a short-ass arc. It's not that long. It has good pacing. It's very snappy. Stuff's constantly happening. Jumping from flashback to flashback. Uh, the, the Poneglyph. The Joy Boys Poneglyph. Uh, talking to Jimbe about what happened. Um, we, we Hody's taken over. We go to the castle. We gotta fight Hody. Goes to Concord Plaza. Uh, um, you know, there's so much happened. The journey down to Fishman Island to the journey out of Fishman Island happens pretty fast. So it actually has pretty damn good pacing. Uh, Tomas said there's more to Vanderdeck and IMO. I know. I know there's more. I mean, I've read the arc like four or five times. I get what Vanderdeck is about, man. I just think that it's it's written in such an annoying and boring and uninteresting way. He's an ugly character, if we're going to be real. Um, he's secondary. He's not even the main villain of the arc, so he's completely sidelined by Hody. He becomes Hody's bitch boy, basically, even though it's supposed to be an equal team. And then on top of all of that... Uh, he is a, a laughing stock. The entire the entire arc, Vanderdecken is a joke. He's a complete joke. He has zero tension behind that character. There's no tension, nothing. Um, I don't like him at all. Character development. Well, Fishman Island is all character development, guys. It's the first time we've seen the Straw Hats do anything since the time skip. 
This is the first time the Straw Hats have been able to show off their new abilities. This is the first time the Straw Hats have been able to, like, show what they can do since the two years have passed. Um, we have Luffy and Jinbei, like, their character development. Luffy accepting a blood, like, Jinbei giving Luffy his blood and having the fish man human, like, blood exchange. Like, that's incredible. Uh, getting to meet Tom's brother at Fishman Island and having that conversation with Frankie. Robin reading the Joy Boy Poneglyph and having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Neptune and asking about the ancient weapons. Um, it's There's so much development. Sanji, Sanji's character development, becoming instantly a, a completely unlikable buffoon in the span of like 10 chapters. Not that I hate Sanji, I like him. He gets a lot better after Fishman Island. But let's admit, Sanji fans fellow Sanji fans. I'm with you guys. I'm on your side. I like Sanji too. Let's let's be real. Let's be real. Sanji and Fishman Island sucks. Sanji and Fishman Island is so aggravating with the nosebleeds, with the turning into stone, with like the he's like incapacitated for half the arc because he he can't deal with the sight of a woman like it's character development, but in the opposite direction. It's not in a good direction. But I'll, I'll just say, I, I was making a joke, but let, let, let's put Sanji to the side. I like Sanji. I think he's great in Dressrosa and Punk Hazard. Uh, I think he's he's good after that. But Fishman Island really was a bad, Sanji was bad in that arc, okay? Uh, when they get to Saba Odi and Sanji is sniffing Perona, like he's up in her face sniffing her, like it's just not good. Like it's, it's not, it, I, I never, I've read through One Piece with my friends. I've gotten people to try One Piece. I have yet to see anyone get up to those jokes and laugh at them. I have yet to see anyone get up to Sanji being a real, real like aggressive perv and finding it funny. I just don't think it's funny. I, most people I've, I've met don't think so. So just gonna put that to the side, but there is character development in Fishman Island. It's full of it. World building, full of world building. Fishman Island has a ton of world building. The locale from from it being under Marijua, all the pirates passed through there. The fact that right, Whitebeard declared it to be his territory to, to protect the fishmen. Joy Boy's apology poneglyph. The fact that it's now Big Mom's territory. The fact that Luffy had to declare it his like that. The the fact that Fishman Island has changed hands between these Yonko, I think, is really cool. It's a big. It's a big. Um, like detail I think about the place and and its location plays a big part in that um the, the fact that it's located right beneath Marijua with the fortune telling and how Luffy's going to destroy Fishman Island could have implications for the end of the story so it has a ton of world building uh the climax is good it's not amazing it's good Luffy taking out Hody but the problem is that it's undercut by Hody not being a great villain so the climax doesn't hit as hard as it should uh, because Hody's not a great villain, Luffy defeating Hody doesn't hit home as much as it should. So, that was okay. Uh, the best part about the climax of the entire arc is Luffy and Jinbei doing the uh, blood transfusion. And then everything else, whatever. Them throwing the party and then saying goodbye and then Luffy promising sh to show Shirahoshi a real forest. Like, it's not the most tearful or, or interesting goodbye or it's not the most deep or, or emotional goodbye. Hody's not the best villain, so Luffy defeating him is nothing crazy. Uh, so the climax itself, like the climactic end to the fight and the end to the arc, it was okay. It was okay, right? Like, it wasn't amazing. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't amazing. So I think the real minus points on Fishman Island are the climax and the villain um, and the like the, the wrap-up for the arc, which, as we were talking about earlier, like, if this is if this is not hitting, it undercuts everything else. If the villain is not hitting, it undercuts the climax. So it had, like, a kind of nasty combination of bad villain hurting the climax, hurting the entire arc, and then I guess we can put as a side note for Fishman Island, Sanji, which also hurt the arc. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think Fishman Island's better than people give it credit for. I honestly give it, like, a 7.5 out of 10 maybe even borderline eight i like fishman island a lot more than punk hazard what did punk hazard lack uh the location is relevant it's a former lab of vega punk it's connected to aokiji akainu but is it interesting i mean it's just like a, a winter wasteland and like laboratory which we already we have a much much better and for those that are going to get mad at me for saying this like that the lab is boring it's a really boring lab by oda standards punk hazard for oda standards is really boring for a lab setting let's be let's be honest with ourselves it's just like machines and gadgets and tubes in the background but 
you know how I know it's boring for Oda standards? Because Oda has given us a lab that is interesting. We got Egghead Island to show us that Oda can make a really cool lab. He can make a really cool laboratory environment, science fiction environment that's like really interesting and unique and captivating. Punk Hazard doesn't really give us that. It's like a very stereotypical like tubes and metal in the background. Um, you know, the island is split in half by ice and fire, but we spend 90% of the arc on the ice half. We don't even... So, like, the whole gimmick of the island being an island split down the middle due to Aoki Jinakainu's fight doesn't really matter because we spend the entire arc on the ice side. Uh, so the location just becomes an ice island, basically. It doesn't... The fire doesn't even matter. Uh, and because of Smiley... Uh, they spend a good chunk of the arc indoors running away from him. Um, it's a it's just like a big, boring lab. And that's what it is. So, you know, it's relevant, not so interesting. Caesar, not a compelling villain. I don't care about Caesar. He's, he's a joke. Uh, he uh, is weak. He gets destroyed without very little effort. Uh, his, his devil fruit seems threatening at first. And then you realize hockey can just counter it. So, whatever. Uh, in a post-hockey world doesn't really make matter much caesar has to bring more to the table he's a literal clown guys i mean there's no clown villains in one piece uh that are that are meant to be taken seriously so his victims are not compelling we went over this earlier the kids we don't care about the kids like they, they did <laughs> don't take that out of context but we don't care about the kids like they're boring the conflict is boring uh, all the interesting stuff comes from Doflamingo, and this is not even his arc, so he undercuts the main villain of the arc. The pacing is shot. The entire pacing of Punk Hazard is uh, very, very all over the place. Um, you know, they, they spend so much time, like, helping Kinemon get his parts back, being split up around the island. A, a solid, like, 10 to 15 chapters are spent with the personality swap straw hats, just, like, doing stuff. And like meeting the kids and like wandering around and planning stuff and talking to Brownbeard and getting the story of why why Caesar is the best and he's the master and why they love Caesar. Um, all it's too slow for me. It's too slow. The best parts of the arc happen very quick and fast. Law versus Smoker, quick and fast. Law and Luffy alliance, very quick. Um, Virgo Smoker, Virgo Law. These are all very quick moments. Luffy defeating Caesar with the uh, elephant gun. You know, th this all happens very, very quick and snappy, and then the rest of the arc, it just feels like uh, like time filler. Like, they're just filling time with nonsense. Um, character development takes a hit in Punk Hazard. Why? Because the Straw Hats spend a majority of the arc body-swapped. So, this is a big problem for Oda when you're writing the arc, right? Because think about this. If you want to make a character have character development... How are you going to do that when you body swap all your characters? Because when you body swap all your characters, that means you have to make the characters basically play flanderized versions of themselves in someone else's body. If Sanji is in Nami's body, Sanji's not going to be allowed to act like Sanji. He's going to have to act like the flanderized version of Sanji in Nami's body. Every scene with Sanji on screen as Nami has to be dedicated to Sanji gushing about how he has boobs now frankie is chopper yep it's funny right these are good for a gag but they don't do anything for character development because frankie is not allowed to develop while he's supposed to be chopper he has to be recognizable as frankie we have to be able to look at chopper and recognize frankie in his body because frankie's got to act like normal frankie he's not allowed to develop because that'll get confusing so they're not really allowed to develop when when you do the body swap thing which is a problem. Uh, the only development that really comes out of Punk Hazard is with Chopper and the kids. And Chopper, once again, his conflicts as a doctor. Uh, really taking an issue with what Caesar's doing. But uh, the rest of the development really comes from Smoker. Once again, Smoker. And that's a lot of it's like uh, backloaded. It's like right at the end. So, you know, uh, character development wise, Punk Hazard wasn't very strong. Um, world building. World building was actually solid in Punk Hazard. They had, you know, the first time we get a look at any any of Vegapunk's labs, locations. 
Uh, all the stuff with the Doflamingo crew, the smiles getting distributed through Joker, through Kaido, you know, for Kaido. There's a lot of like little world building things like that. Uh, Smiley and uh, and the uh, the Devil Fruit transference. I, I actually didn't mention that when we talked about it earlier. So the world, but there is some world building in Punk Hazard. It's just not as good as most of the other arcs. It's mostly set up for the later arcs. Punk Hazard feels like. A lot of setup for Dressrosa and a lot of setup for Wano and and nothing nothing individually that lets it stand on its own as a memorable or enjoyable arc. Uh, it's kind of a chore to to reread through if I'm going to be honest. And the climax and payoff, not good, not good. I'm going to be real. I don't really think about Luffy defeating Caesar ever. It, it never comes to. My, it's just not a good moment. I just don't really care about it. Um, and the payoff of them like partying with the Marines, like all right, whatever. Like, we already know that Smoker thinks highly of Luffy. Like, we already know that Smoker is, like, kind of chill with Luffy. We got that in Alabasta. So this isn't anything new. It, it's just a repeat of what we got before. Uh, so, you know, the, the most exciting part was Doflamingo pulling up, and that was, like, one chapter. So the, the payoff, Punk Hazard, the climax didn't do it much for me. Um, so this is what I'm talking about, right? This is why, so in my opinion, I think of all the major arcs, I'm not including minor ones. So I'm not including Syrup Village. I'm not including Long Ring. Uh, of all the major lengthy arcs in One Piece, in my personal opinion, I think Punk Hazard is the worst, the single worst one. I think it's the lowest point for the writing. It's, it just has the least to bring to the table. If I, if I could put every single major arc of One Piece in front of you, maybe I'm wrong. Would a majority of you guys, how, how would you feel? Maybe I should do this in a poll. Would would Punk Hazard be the last arc you'd pick if I put every One Piece arc? Okay, let me, let me do this. All right, so I'm putting up the poll. The question in the poll that we're putting up is, you're on a desert island, okay? You have to stay on a desert island. You can take every major arc in One Piece with you, but one. Do you leave Punk Hazard behind? Let's see what the answer is. I'm curious. I'm actually very curious to see what the results are. It's so far, it's like 68% yes. So like a majority of people in the chat right now would agree they would leave Punk Hazard behind. What counts as a major arc? An arc that dedicated like, let's say at least 20 to 30 chapters. Like an, an arc like that, that actually you spent, we spent a large, like a significant amount of time there. So that's why I'm saying no long ring because that was like 10 chapters, no whiskey peak, no syrup village. Like these are really short, like mini arcs. I'm talking about, you know, when we get to the grand line, we get Alabasta. Like that's the first chunky arc. I'm talking about the chunky arcs, the big ones, the ones that are like 40 chapters, roughly, you know, like 30 to 40 minimum, right? Uh, of all the big ones, um, I feel like, Thrill uh, not, not Thriller Bar, Punk Hazard is the one I would leave behind. K Maya said outlier here, but I ditch Wano before I give up Punk Hazard. That's interesting. That's a hot take in my opinion. I would I I would much rather take Wano with me than uh, than Punk Hazard. I would I would reread Wano ten times before I would reread Punk Hazard once. Yeah, see, well, it kind of, like you said, Whiskey Peak, you think it's the worst art, but that's the thing, right? Whiskey Peak's like five, six chapters. It's so small and inconsequential. You know, you don't even have the time to hate on Whiskey Peak because it's gone before you even realize. Like, it's over and done with before. Like, you don't even have time to get comfortable on Whiskey Peak. But if you get to Punk Hazard or if you get to Thriller Bark or to some of these arcs that people consider to be weaker, Fishman, I'll give it to you. We have to stay there for like a significant... Uh, we have to stay there for a significant time. Like, if you don't like Whiskey Peak, well, good news, it's over in, like, two chapters. 
But if you have, if you don't like Punk Hazard, bad news. You're gonna be here for 40 chapters. The amount of people I I know that tried to get through One Piece. One of my close friends. Okay, I don't know if he's watching the stream right now, but if you are, give me a shout in the chat. One of my close friends. I'm trying to get him into One Piece, and he's been on and off. He's not loving One Piece right now, uh, and he the biggest problem for him is the pacing. But um, he's on and off, and I'm trying to get him through, and he is hard walled right now by by punk hazard he can't push through he really doesn't like punk hazard it's so boring for him and uh and i he hasn't continued reading since he's like 10 chapters away from the end and i'm begging him i'm like bro bro please just finish please read the, just get to the end bro he doesn't doesn't want to it's like that's how bad it is like for him it's like punk hazard's really like if, if you don't like the arc you're stuck with it for a good minute you know, that's why I can't hold, I can't give the pressure to Whiskey Peak because Whiskey Peak doesn't do that. No one stops reading One Piece at Whiskey Peak because it's so short that you finish it before you even can think about stopping. Um, it robe like, I'll tell you this, when I was getting caught up on One Piece, the first time I was watching the anime, maybe this is because of the anime, but when I was getting caught up on One Piece, I got roadblocked by Punk Hazard, okay? I went on... I went on three hiatuses re get, getting caught up on One Piece. One of them was in Thriller Bark, the other was in Punk Hazard, and the last one was in Whole Cake. I love Whole Cake. The, the, the hiatus for that was for different reasons. But Thriller Bark and Punk Hazard, I had to take a break, bro. I was trying to get caught up, and I had to take a fucking break. They were, they were too much for me. It was too slow, too, like, boring not the characters did not compel me all the things we listed out and talked out talked about today they just didn't do it for me they didn't do it for me so yeah i i i think there's something to that and and i'm gonna we got 64 votes here i'll close it i'll close it at that whatever it pulls up polls pretty much showing the same thing so it seems like roughly uh over 50 percent of people agree that they would they would leave punk hazard behind and the people that said no which are the rest of that would pick another arc. So that doesn't mean that it, they would pick Fishman Island. That means like any of the other arcs in One Piece are on the table for them to take to leave behind instead of Punk Hazard. But most people seem to agree on this singular arc being the one that they would ditch. So uh, you know, it's not exactly a fifty. Even if it is fifty-six to forty-three, it's fifty-six in favor of ditching Punk Hazard and forty-three in favor of ditching literally anything else. So Punk Hazard versus the whole series, and still most people would leave behind Punk Hazard. So, you know, I'm just saying, I don't think any other, um, I don't think any other arc is going to be doing it like that. So that's that's where that's where I'm at with that. Dressrosa we've talked about we talked about how it hits on all these I think the pacing is the big problem with Dressrosa uh, the pacing is the big minus um, and uh, you know the, the, the location's fine I mean the relevancy of it is is a little yeah it's it's okay the locations eh pacing's not good but everything else is good amazing villain amazing victims amazing conflict good character development good world building amazing payoff and climax so Dress Rose is awesome. Dress Rose is awesome. Uh, the pacing is, uh, I mean, better in the manga than the anime. The anime killed it uh, with the pacing. Uh, Zo, Zo is is okay. Zo's okay. It has an amazing, relevant location. Really, really interesting. Adds a lot to the story. Uh, the road poneglyph stuff. The minx. All that's great. The villains lackluster. Jack sucks. It's hardly a villain. Uh, there's hardly a conflict, honestly. The conflict in, in Zoe is already done and gone by the time the Straw Hats get there. There's not much of a conflict to be had on Zoe. And when it does come back, when Jack returns, he gets brushed away by Zunisha like that. So, whatever. Uh, so, the victims, though, the Rizo is safe moment and the Minx being tortured and gassed by Jack. That's compelling. All that stuff. So, they have good victims. It's just the villain and the conflict are not very good. Um, but the location and the victims are great. The pacing is super snappy, really, really short and sweet. Yep, Derek, I agree. Short and sweet, good pacing, doesn't overstay its welcome. Gone before you can hate it. Character development, huge character development, because this is the arc that we get the Vin Smoke Sanji thing. Sanji gets kidnapped and got, gets brought to Whole Cake, and we learn about the Germa Double Six family. Um, the Straw Hats had been split up and now they're trying to reunite and they're still split up again and 
You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of character development that happens on Zo. The 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 Samurai Mink Pirate Alliance happens on Zo. Um all that stuff. It's 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 great for character development. It's great for pacing. The minks are cool. The location's cool. The world building's great. The climax is not very I don't there's not really a climax. Zo has kind of an anti-climax. Um Jack getting knocked off Zunisha is about it, and then they're like, okay, we gotta go save Sanji. Let's split up again. You guys go to Wano, we'll go to Whole Cake. Okay. Like, the climax is not there. There's not really a climax and payoff. That's a big problem. That's a huge problem with Zo, actually, now that I think about it. This kind of makes the rest of the arc feel like it's just a pass-through arc. Like, we're just... It, it's not a destination. It's more so just like a pit stop along the way, and we're just over and done with it. So... The real minuses are uh, on Zo are the climax and payoff, um, the uh, the villain and the conflict. Uh, so, you know, it's almost like um, once again, it's another one of those situations where it's more so set up for the future rather than a standalone good arc on its own. It's not it's not a good story in a vacuum. It works in junction with everything else. Then we have Wano. Um, what should I say about Wano that I haven't already said? Oh, wait, whole cake. <sighs> like the stream, guys, please do. Um, if you like, if you like the streams, if you enjoy these streams, if you want to support the channel, please do like them. Uh, and if you want to take it a step further, it would really help me out a lot. Become a channel member. You get access to all these very nice emojis. Uh, I do have some members only videos. I haven't uploaded any in a long time, but we we're doing streams like five days a week now. So just being a member, having that badge of honor, I do priority responses to my members and you get the emojis. You can participate in that. I invite you to join. Um, so that would help me out, out a lot as well. Uh, but if you don't want to do that, or if you can't liking the stream is more than enough. That helps me too. So whole cake Island, amazing location, relevant location. Interesting. Villain is okay. I have my problems with Big Mom. The victims, once again, it's a mixed bag. The people of Whole Cake themselves, I don't really care. But Sanji, Sanji's great. And I I, I care. The whole Whole Cake arc is it revolves around Sanji. So I care about Sanji, what happens to him. I care about Zeph. So, yeah, the victims are a mixed bag. You, you have the actual people being affected by Big Mom that live there aren't, doesn't really matter. But... Uh, the victims in the Straw Hats and the protagonist side of it, they, it does matter a lot. So the victims are compelling. It's it, like I said, mixed bag. The conflict is very compelling. Everything leading up to the wedding, the whole build up to the wedding, uh, the whole thing with the Germa family and the and, and that also ties into the world building because you have you get to learn about the double six, the German double six, the cloning, the super soldiers, taking over the North Blue, Sanji's history with his family, where he really came from, the political marriages that Big Mom is trying to do, the fact that she's categorizing all these different races in her books and stuff like that. You know, there's a lot of world building, really good world building in Whole Cake. There's a lot of insane character development. I mean, I don't even have to go into the, the details with Sanji and Luffy's character development in Whole Cake Island, right? Um, Pedro and Carrot's character development in that arc. Brooke's character development in Whole Cake Island. Um, Nami, I mean, Nami, Nami had character development there too. I mean, it's so good in terms of the characters. That's the biggest strength of Whole Cake is the location and characters. Really good. Really good. Luffy grew a lot over the course of that arc. Re like, you know, talking about Sanji's value, opening up about that, trying to win Sanji back. The fight with Katakuri changed Luffy a shit ton. Uh, yeah, it's such a good character development arc. The the pacing is a little bit of, uh, eh, you know, like it's, it's sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, slow. Like the, the wedding cake chase is very slow. Uh, the beginning of the arc is pretty slow. But... Overall, when, when shit's getting good, the pacing's good. When when stuff needs to happen, the pacing is good. It has those good backstories, those good flashbacks. The Big Mom flashback's incredible. Uh, the Sanji flashback is incredible. All the stuff we get with Pedro, incredible. The sacrifice, the climax and payoff for Whole Cake is phenomenal. Luffy and Katakuri's fight, beautiful, amazing. Sanji and Pudding, all that stuff, 
crashing the wedding, Sanji making the cake, putting saying goodbye to Sanji and giving him his kiss. Sanji finally, finally, my man Sanji gets some pussy. And he loses his memory. She, she pulls the memory out of his head. And uh, she gives him the kiss and says goodbye. And it's, it's so sad and emotional and, and hard-hitting. Uh, Luffy breaking the mirror, putting him and Katakuri in a 1v1, fighting Katakuri, getting to, getting to learn this deeper side to this bad guy. And he's actually like a, a rather honorable dude. And, and it's like, it's such a good climactic end to the arc. Um, and the, the finale of Whole Cake, the fact that they had to end the arc by running away and escaping Big Mom and the, the bad end musical and the singing and uh and the fact that like they couldn't just get out of whole cake they had to sp they had to get out of whole cake like they had to run for their lives the fishman had to come in and help them fend off big mom they had to fend they, they had to f help uh you know let the straw hats get an easy escape jimbei had to help be the ship uh the, the helmsman and like get them and steer them out of there and you have all of big mom's fleet chasing them and it's all this dramatic they don't have time to party what i love about the end of whole cake is that they don't have time to celebrate the celebrations have to happen on the go because they have an emperor on their ass and they have no choice but to run for their life. Uh, <clears throat> so that's a really, really great climax and finish to the arc. It's it's so high intensity. It, it's so dramatic. And it's it's a good way to, to bookend the first experience we have in the story with a Yonko in a Yonko's territory. It really illustrates how dangerous the Yonko are, and the end of the arc hammers that home. This is not somewhere you can just celebrate. You can't just beat the bad guy and celebrate. No, you beat the bad guy by getting a one-up on them and, and basically foiling her plans, but you couldn't defeat her in battle. Big Mom's still alive, and she's chasing you. You don't have time to celebrate. You got to get the fuck out. That is a great, unique ending to the arc, a unique climax, a great payoff. Them getting Sanji back and then Sanji going... All right, guys, what do you want to eat? And it's the parallel, the panel with Zef and Sanji, like talking about, you know, cooking for their, for their, for their boys. And you have them above each other, like Sanji's real father. Oh, it's so good, man. It's so good. It's so good. It's such a good ending. So yeah, Whole Cake's amazing. Wano, we've talked about, I actually don't want to stress out my throat anymore talking about Wano. And Egghead, I don't want to give the full judgment on because we're not done with it. But so far, Egghead has this. I have to bold, big bold letters. Interesting and relevant location. Egghead is like the king of that. It's so good for that. Uh, although I wish Egghead Island itself was fleshed out more. Uh, I don't really feel the... Uh, like, there's supposed to be a city with people living on it in, in Egghead. But I really feel like we'd never get to see the, the people living there. Like, it doesn't really... They're like so tertiary to everything. It doesn't matter. Uh, but it does have a very interesting relevant location. The villains, I mean, do I have to say anything about this? The fucking Goro say Saturn? Do I, I do I have to the Kizaru? Do I have, Rob Lucci? Come on. <laughs> like the villains, amazing. Amazing location, amazing villains, amazing victims. Kuma, Bonnie, bro, Vegapunk, bro, come on. Conflict, like this is so free. All of this is so free. The pacing, I think it's good. In some areas, I think it's a little too quick. But in other areas, I think it's perfect. And I'll be honest, at this point in the story, I'm okay with faster pacing. I'm fine with it moving more quickly because we've spent a lot of time in Wano, a lot of time in Whole Cake and Dressrosa. We need to kind of wrap things up now. And if if the world is falling apart and if, if the world is coming to uh if the world is coming to like a climax in general, it makes sense to me that events are gonna move more quickly. We don't have time to dawdle around. Shit's going down. One thing goes down in one location causes another thing to go down in another location causes another thing to go down in another location it's a chain reaction and shit's constantly happening because it's getting real it's getting crazy right now of course stuff's going to be happening fast i would expect no less from the final saga so it it, it feels like the pacing I, I think is fine for egghead and we've we've had a it's, it's not a short arc we've been on egghead for a good minute now i think it's much longer than a lot of people expected egghead to be uh, and I still don't feel like it's slow. You know? It hasn't felt like... It hasn't felt like 60 chapters or whatever. It's felt like 30. It's moving so quickly and there's so much happening every single chapter that it really respects the reader's time. I don't feel like my time is ever wasted reading an Egghead chapter. Something significant always happens. 
and we're always cutting back to other things like Kid, Law, Kobe, what they're doing on their respective islands. We keep getting these cutaways and seeing what's happening elsewhere in the world all in the same arc. And then we have Kuma's flashback and we get to see God Valley. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. Character development, amazing. World building, amazing. We still got to wait to see what this is. We don't know about the climax and payoff. We're not there yet. I have a feeling it's going to be amazing. If, if I'm repeating myself here, I apologize. But I'm just saying, everything else has been A plus for Egghead. Everything else has been A fucking plus. I'm pretty certain the, the, the payoff, the climax of Egghead is going to be phenomenal. So I'm expecting that. And if it does, then I'm happy to put Egghead in my top three arcs of all time. I'm happy to put it in my top two. If I'm being perfectly honest with you guys... Um, for me, my top three right now is looking like Water 7, Ennius, I'm, I'm combining them. Water 7, Ennius Lobby at number one. Egghead at number three. Or well, Marine Ford at number two, Egghead at number three. And if Egghead has a good ending, Egghead moves to number two over Marine Ford. It depends on the ending. Depending on how Egghead finishes, I might move it up above Marine Ford in the number two spot. But, uh... If it doesn't have the best ending, then I'm going to keep it at number three. Marine Ford will still be number two for me. But but yeah, I mean, that's where I'm at with that. And uh, yeah, so it's basically Water 7, Ennius Lobby, Egghead, and Marine Ford are my three best arcs in the story. Uh, and then a runner-up, like an honorable mention for the top four, if if you're not counting Impel Down as part of Marine Ford. Uh, Impel Down is my, my number four. And... Dress Rosa is my number five, I think. I think that's my order. I, uh, that's my order. El Elbaf has has high potential. I think Elbaf is going to be up there if, if it's done correctly. And then we'll see where the rest of the story goes. Bottom three arcs, uh, in my opinion, the worst. If I'm like individual arcs, it's tough. I mean, Long Ring is down there. Uh, we I've already established Punk Hazard is down there for me. Thriller Bark is down there for me. Syrup Village is terrible. Uh... And, and I, I, I hate to use these strong words because I still like all of One Piece. Every arc of One Piece I would read over a bunch of... There's I, I would rather read Punk Hazard or Syrup Village or Thriller Bark over like 90% of manga, okay? So don't get me wrong. I don't think it's terrible, like, in general. I just think for One Piece standards, there's such low points by comparison. Uh, Saba Odi, we didn't talk about Saba Odi, but I, I kind of like lump it in with the Summit War saga. But, you know, I think Sabaody also checks all the boxes. The Celestial Dragons are compelling. The Slaves and, and Kami and everything, that's all compelling. Uh, the, the conflict is very, very compelling. Luffy punching a Celestial Dragon is one of the best moments in the entire story. And that's the conflict being illustrated in a single panel is Luffy punching Charlos in the face. All this is good. This is amazing. Amazing location, relevant location, super unique visually. Really weird, funny, interesting concept for like the bubbles and all that. Amazing pacing, super fast. Character development, phenomenal. Phenomenal character development. Luffy losing his crew, crying, pounding the ground. Kuma like helping him without us knowing he's helping him. The world building, so much world building in Sabaody. So much of it. You know, uh, that's like the entire thing is world building. The connection of Fishman Island, the auction house, the proximity to Marine Ford and, and the, the Navy and the Celestial Dragons being introduced. I mean, remember, the Celestial Dragons weren't a thing until Sabaody. They were introduced in Sabaody. We have to give that the world building there. That's like the, you know, like, th think about that. Like, the world building is uh, in Sabaody is so good, it introduced one of the most important villains in the series, being the Celestial Dragons. And then the climax and payoff, it's the climax and payoff is incredible. So, actually, I'm sorry, in my top five, I gotta put, if we're counting these all separately, if we're counting everything separately, then it's, it's, uh, I guess, I, I guess Water Se I, I can't separate Water 7 Ennius Lobby because their themes and story, they're, 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 plot lines are so inter interconnected but so water seven any lobby is my number one of all time egghead and marine ford are flip-flopping on two and three and then four and five is probably it's probably impel down and, and sabo the archipelago uh impel down i love i could talk all day about impel down we'll have to do that in a separate stream but i love everything about the structure of impel down the dante's inferno reference the the the, the structure of Luffy recruiting former villains to work with him and, like, get them on his side. The whole jailbreak concept, the fact that Luffy has to run away from the villain. He doesn't defeat him. 
He doesn't manage to defeat him. He just has to escape. And that's the that's the way to win, is to escape. Um, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Uh, Impel Down's so good. Dress Rosa, I would give it number six, I guess. Uh, number seven after Dress Rosa. Whole Cake Island is, is right after Dress Rosa there. Um, right after Whole Cake is Skypea. Yeah, after Whole Cake is Skypea. After Skypea is... Maybe, maybe Wano. I think I put Wano after Skypea. After Wano is uh, Alabasta. After Alabasta is Fishman Island. Actually, no, maybe I put Fishman maybe above Alabasta. I don't know. I, I really like the flashbacks on Fishman Island, man. I can't get over that. It's so, they're so good. Uh, and I like the location more than Alabasta. But no, no, probably Alabasta, then Fishman Island, then Thriller Bark. Uh, then Zoe, then Thriller Bark. And then, then like East Blue and then Punk Hazard at the bottom. I think that's where I'm at. I think that's where I'm at with that. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah. So guys, I, I have, my voice is tired. <laughs> I, we've covered a lot today. I, I pretty much given my my uh my breakdown here i hope this all i know i didn't get a lot of time to talk to the chat this stream i'm sorry about that i did have a lot to say we had a lot to cover um i wish i could have interacted more with you know the the chats i, th I think i missed a super chat let me get to that k maya thank you for the five dollars uh k maya asked who had beige as a better developed supernova than kid on their bingo cards <laughs> yeah whole cake island put beige at number four on my supernova list well thank you and uh i think that beige I don't know if he's a better, like, a, I, I think he's more developed currently. I think Kid's going to have more development later. Like, we're not done with Kid. But, yeah, I mean, Beige got a lot. I mean, that was that was huge. I did not expect Beige to shine that much in Whole Cake Island. That was very surprising for me. Um, so, yeah, guys. Uh, I wish I could have interacted more with the uh, with the chats in general but i wanted to uh i wanted to really focus on getting my thoughts out and 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 elaborated on and you know you could almost treat this like a video of mine you know like like just this is a big breakdown of what i think of all the arcs in one piece what makes a good arc why i think some arcs are better than others i hope that because of this list that i put together here when i say an arc is good or bad or better or worse than another i hope that this kind of like makes sense as to why I think so. I, I, I hope that this outlines the, these are the things that when I'm reading an arc, this is what I'm comparing in my head. I'm thinking about each of these points and trying to compare them and be like, okay, what did this do well? What did this not do well? And that's where I come to my conclusions from. That's why I roast Wano all the time because Wano had a lot of problems in a lot of these areas. Uh, and you know, that's why I, I hate on Punk Hazard. That's why I hate on uh, things like Thriller Bark sometimes, you know. I'll roast these arcs uh, because they, they, they fall short in a lot of these categories. So, with that all being said, uh, if you disagree with me, that's totally fine. I respect it. I welcome it. Feel free to let me know in the comments. Everyone in chat, before we go, uh, say hi and goodbye to YouTube. I'm assuming there's going to be people watching the VODs later. So say hello or wave goodbye, whatever you want to do. Say hello to the YouTube chat. Say hello to everyone that's watching this video from the future. Uh, and uh, I want to just thank everyone that was here today. Thank you for being a part of the streams. I hope to see you on the next one. Um, we got we got Persona 3 tomorrow. We got hopefully another collab on Wednesday. If I can't get that lined up, we might do the, the mod stream uh that i've been planning uh and then we got melee probably on thursday we might do chapter reactions on fridays from now on this last chapter reaction i did on a friday instead of saturday and the view count was lower than normal i don't know if that's because of the algo i don't know if that's because i'm streaming too much and people aren't clicking on it whatever it is I might try Saturday for the chapter reaction this next week instead, and then we'll do this discussion stream like today. We'll do that next Friday. Uh, so if you're interested, I'll be streaming all week. Catch me on those days. If you want to know my schedule, it's listed on my channel. Go check the about section. It'll be there. And uh, yeah, I appreciate everybody. Thanks for being here. I hope you have a good rest of your day, a good night, and a wonderful romance dawn. Take it easy. Take care. Like and subscribe. And I'll see you next time.